materials that we've been we've been trying to uh, do as as part of Remind. Uh, and so a lot of this work is is now funded by DOE and and uh, initially was started with support from the Belch Foundation, uh, NSF, and and NASA. And these are some of the the people that have worked on this in my group. Uh, so Remind is a, a a relatively new EFRC funded uh, last year, as as Bua mentioned. It's called reconfigurable electronic materials inspired by nonlinear neuron dynamics, and we've got uh, Texas A and M along with uh, NREL, Sandia, and Berkeley as, as part of the center. And uh, what we set out to do is, is a little bit different from a lot of other efforts in this area, um, really to kind of try to get, get at the basic science of neuromorphic materials, try to understand the foundational scientific uh, mechanisms that underpin large uh, electronic transitions, and really to be able to go back from uh, the sorts of neuronal functionality that we see uh, or we desire um, down to understanding coupling of external fields with material properties and then, then to material design ideas, right? So to flip that current uh, paradigm uh, and, and through both inverse and forward design, uh, unravel mechanisms that we could use for uh, information processing in the way of neurons and synapses. So that's our overall goal. Um, you've had a, a really amazing workshop. So I don't have to uh, say too much about it, about the need for this, but I think we are all aware we are entering into this uh, unprecedented era of uh, you know, AI, which is which is really has the potential to change our lives, you know, like nothing has in the last uh, uh, half, a, half a century, right? And uh, uh, there's many different implications for this. And, and uh, one of them is that I think it's very relevant to DOE is that about, uh, you know, somewhere close to 10% of all energy consumption now worldwide goes to process, store and transmit information. Uh, centralized data servers alone are consuming about 1% of global energy uh, consumption. And then, you know, 90% of all data is discarded within three hours without any analysis whatsoever, because we just do not have the computational capabilities to, uh, to deal with it. And, and so this, this super exponential growth of data, and, and as we move towards this internet of things, and we've got 18 billion things in the internet of things, we're going to have to have a whole new paradigm for processing information both uh, not just in the cloud, but also at the edge. And that's really uh, where Remind comes in to, to think about the uh, possibilities, right? There's a tremendous opportunity here to do things differently, to integrate sensing, cognition, uh, perception um, in a way that is more human, right? In a way that connects to our, uh, real human intelligence and the human experience, right? So. This is, this is our, our broad perspective. And um, this is a, a quote from my, my colleague, Stan Williams, that I love to use, that the, ed, the end of Moore's Law could be the best thing that has happened ever since the beginning of Moore's Law, right? So we're in the midst of this, this uh, super exponential growth and general purpose computing is hitting a, hitting a wall and there's tremendous opportunity here. And, and I would also say that there's tremendous opportunity for basic science for really uh, doing working on topics that are of interest to the Office of Science because industrial product development doesn't really leave room for foundational work. Um, and and, and our, we ignore foundations of neuromorphic computing at our own peril because uh, you know a lot of the challenges that we're seeing comes from the widespread prevalence of, of empiricisms, ad hoc designs, heuristics that get propagated. And so there's really a need to uh, explore the foundations of neuromorphic computing. And, and there's often very limited um, appetite uh, for risk in industry with regards to, to new materials and mechanisms. And so I think uh, uh, basic energy science is a, is a really good place to, to look at this. Um, I won't go through all the details, but uh, this is our overall framework, right? So the idea is that we don't fully understand the mechanisms that we could potentially be using to emulate neuro neuronal functions. 
And, and that's oftentimes because we do not understand how structure and electronic structure evolves um, in response to electric fields and temperature in these far from equilibrium environments. Um, and, and this is, I think, a real opportunity for the APS with its incredible set of uh, tools to, to, to really help lay the foundations of these mechanisms, right? Uh, and, uh, and because we do not understand these mechanisms, right? So then a big uh, second problem is, is this one right here, where you see, uh, you know, uh, we oftentimes do not have an understanding of how to disentangle transformation characteristics, right? How do we control uh, each of these conductance contrast, hysteresis, threshold voltage, and so on and so forth. And, uh, and, and then not having these design rules that map back specific complex function to intrinsic uh, circuit properties first, then interface properties and material properties. And so, so kind of going through this hierarchy um, is, a, is a major uh, obstacle to, to designing uh, materials for this next generation of devices, right? And, and oftentimes we, we just do not have sufficient knowledge on the limits of how far can we push this, right? And, and is it worthwhile to, to pursue a certain class of material versus others? So um, what I hope to convey to you in my, in my brief talk today is, is the need for fundamental science to really understand mechanisms so that we can um, address all of these, these big gaps in, and so that we can uh, uh, make connections all the way from neuronal synaptic function down to intrinsic material properties, a lot of which will require being able uh, improvements in measurement science, where I think the APS and its new capabilities will be really, really amazing and really critical, right? So this is what our, uh, our goals are that are related uh, directly to the uh, uh, knowledge gaps is to uh, identify novel switching mechanisms and, and come up with experimental tools across length, time, and energy scale so that we can understand how microscopic elements and, and ensembles of such elements react when uh, they are um, in the presence of a certain stimulus uh, very far from equilibrium, right? So that's, that's a key uh, uh, idea. Uh, so I wanna say, um, and I think there's a tremendous opportunity for collaboration here as soon as y'all are up and running again, is we, uh, one of our distinctive features, so Remind focuses on two classes of materials, uh, intercalation materials, so strongly correlated uh, transition metal oxides with the potential for uh, ion intercalation, um, and then also um, uh, redox active coordination complexes that have redox cascades. And in both cases, we've got this tremendous, um, uh, I think, uh, very unique capability. We, we have very large crystal foundries. So that means that we've got single crystals of these. Uh, we have the ability to grow single crystals, uh, which you can then of course section or use as is. And, and indeed one of the uh, things we're most excited about right now is our ability to build neuromorphic oscillators, not just out of 10 film devices, but out of entire single crystals, which then uh, of course, you know, uh, throws open opportunities for doing all kinds of um, X-ray science, right? And and this is this is something that uh, I think we uh, are going to be really interested in exploring with Hua and colleagues. And um, so this is our this is our Remind team across across four institutions. Um, okay, and this is this is again uh, just a little bit of introduction. We're going to, we also have aspirations at Texas A&M for going beyond just, uh, uh, you know, our, this, this focus on materials to really this entire framework of co-design and, and uh, you know, all the way from designing algorithms to coming up with uh, foundations, mathematical foundations for neuromorphic computing. All of this has to really get integrated and, and that's something we're interested in doing. Um, so, if I break it down, right? So I know you all have heard a, a lot of beautiful talks yesterday. If I if I break it down just a bit uh, into what we're trying to do, right? So ideally we'd like a material with a strongly nonlinear response. This is shown here for VO2. And, and, and this provides a mechanism for building, let's, as an example, it doesn't have to be the only one, uh, spiking neural networks where you can have different spikes come in 
And, and this is a very simple uh, illustration of a, of a thresholding phenomenon or amplification phenomenon. And, and then ideally we'd like not just a neuron, we'd like to also build a, build a synapse. And um, this Im involves uh, taking a neuronal material, applying a certain uh, uh, distinctive stimulus and moving it from one part of this to, so that it, you can access a second nonlinear regime. And this can often be facilitated by uh, something like uh, ionic liquid gating, oxygen vacancies, uh, and what we've done more recently, proton diffusion or lithium ion diffusion, right? So in, in many senses, some of these can behave like battery materials, right? And so we can, um, and then and if you do this right, you can of course build out a system that does interesting computations, uh, this, uh, as was shown by my colleague, uh, Stan Whittingham, and one of the things that he demonstrated, which has been uh, a, a leitmotif for our work in Remind, is, is to look for um, behaviors such as nonlinear dynamics and this, this edge of chaos behavior, uh, because this, this edge of chaos behavior allows you to um, find global solutions, not just get stuck in local minima. And, and finding the set of conditions which gets you into this edge of uh, chaos behavior is, is super uh, interesting, uh, but non-trivial. And, and this requires uh, uh, you know, controlling all of these, these sort of neuronal um, uh, characteristics. And, and this requires a lot of inverse design, which has benefited both from understanding a mechanism as well as understanding of uh, uh, you know, using, using uh, machine learning uh, tools to, to circle back and identify the most promising regions where we would find this behavior given a set of material properties. So, um, so materials, interesting materials are, you know, are, 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 of course, at the heart of this, but, uh, you know, are not, are, are necessary, but not sufficient. There has to be, uh, you know, real precise uh, modulation of interfaces in uh, coupling to external fields as well. And, and then this is the idea, uh, is we want to have a fundamental tool set um, of different mechanisms and materials so we can build out chaotic oscillators, uh, amplifiers, and so on and so forth, right? And then we can go back and, and do this in inverse design. Um, so if I start breaking it down again as a chemist and a material scientist, these are a set of criteria we're looking for. We'd like something to have a very non, uh, strongly nonlinear relationship between voltage and current, a very low input power that elicits elicit switching, uh, operating temperature in the range of operation. Uh, we'd like a billion, at least a billion, maybe much more um, cycles and uh, multiple internal states. So as, as a first descriptor, right, I think what has become um, often quite clear is that uh, we, we would like to see large transitions in, conduct in conductivity, um, in conductance, but with, without a lot of things moving around, without a lot of lattice distortions, because, because the more you have these, the more entropy dissipative these are. And so this has been uh, really, uh, how do we achieve, if I were to sort of, you know, uh, get one wish, uh, it would be, how do I get large electronic transitions with very minimal lattice distortions, right? And, and so this is, this is our goal. And, uh, and then as, as part of this, you know, again, I, I, I touched upon this at the beginning, how do we change, disentangle and, and uh, get some control over these transformation characteristics? Because um, subtle differences in the steepness of onset in the conductance contrast and how sharp this is strongly affects the, the uh, function of the uh, oscillator or any other device you're gonna try to build. And so, so being able to control material properties, just like you can control silicon properties, right? Is really, really uh, uh, key, but, but is, is, is again, very, very non-trivial for most of the systems. Uh, so coming down to materials, we can frame this as a problem of navigating energy landscapes. How do I go back and forth uh, across multiple uh, local minima? And uh, through large barriers or small barriers, how do we modify barriers and 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 uh, change uh, you know coupling of spin charge orbital lattice atomic degrees of freedom? Um, so we'll start with with a compound that has uh, you know um, got 
gotten a lot of interest from, from for many decades, which is VO2, which has got this large uh, electronic transition. I, I put up here, just as some background, you know, the conductivities for a lot of different oxides. And it's, a, it's an amazing property, right? So conductivity spans 23 orders of magnitude. If you think about what properties span a very large, uh, um, you know, range. This is this is an, an really interesting one. A uh, lot of insulators that you know, like dirt, and and, and a lot of conductors. A very small fraction that undergo these transformations, especially at uh, temperatures we care about. And and there's different mechanisms for this. In VO2, it's a mixed Burleson um, mod uh, um, transition, um, and it does have. Um, a substantial component oftentimes that has to do with depairing of, of uh, vanadium, vanadium dimers along uh, one directional chain. And so there is a substantial structural transfer uh, component to it. And, and again, what we're aiming for is something that is, you know, almost entirely a mod transition, something that where we can get a large change in conductivity, but um, we can uh, induce, uh, we can drive this using uh, charge injection or by facilitating band overlap and, and so that with relatively minimal lattice changes going on. Um, so this is a compendium that Justin Andrews, a former student of mine, put together uh, just about to start as a faculty member at Purdue. So Justin um, really looked combed through the literature and of course nature is, is, is not kind. There's relatively few compounds that are in this range of uh, where we would like, you know, where data centers operate. Uh, there's a few entries like niobium oxide that are way too high, and then you know VO2 is is is, is too low, and so that um, brings me to some mechanisms we're trying to discover. Um, VO2 uh, is has has uh, absorbed a lot of our interest. Okay, so we've got this four orders of magnitude MIT. We can tune hysteresis with and so so on and so forth, and we've sought to to navigate this this energy landscape through alloying. Um, because uh, the idea is, could you could you essentially modify the nature of the transformation, and by modifying the nature of the transformation, um, make it less lattice and more more uh, mod uh, transition, right? And and so um, over, uh, I'm going to just summarize some of the findings. But this is a again a, a beautiful picture that David Santos and my group put together, uh, where you can see a lot of different knobs that we have for tuning. Um, the the transformation characteristics and this allows us to start putting together a set of design rules and and one of the things you could do is of course uh, introduce a, a, a dopant um, like tungsten or molybdenum and that suppresses the phase transformation down um, and and so what does the dopant do this is this is a tungsten this is a but uh, um, uh, uh, Reza Yasser's group at uh, UIC. Um, and, and essentially tungsten applies this massive strain, anisotropic strain in the lattice and these large dopants. Uh, and because of the strain, the monoclinic phase gets and, and ends up getting quite distorted, right? And, and these large distortion therefore uh, increases the, the uh, thermodynamic driving force with the phase transition. So you end up stabilizing the tetragonal phase at a lower, lower temperature. And also immediately around the tungsten atom, we've, we've done a lot of local probe measurements using, using methods such as, uh, um, well, XAPS. And you see an increase in local symmetry that looks a lot like this uh, tetragonal rutile phase. So, so the tungsten um, atoms act as act, uh, sort of as uh, local, um, um, as, uh, as um, a Trojan horse, really, to induce this transformation. Um, we find, interestingly, very distinctive behavior going up and down. So the forward transition versus the, the, the uh, reverse transition. So we've been able to identify these M2 phases that, that form that are strain stabilized. Uh, and, and these, as well as the phase boundaries, are where the, the transition nucleates uh, on the way up. And so there is not a very large kinetic uh, um, component to the forward transition, but there is a is a more uh, more of a kinetic component to the, the reverse transition, and the and the reason for that is is the two, the tetragonal phase of course does not have um, uh, these these multiple multiple uh, variants, and because it doesn't have 
these these twin uh, boundaries and 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 uh, and phase boundaries, the only place that um, that the that the nucle that the transition can nucleate is on oxygen vacancies, and tungsten ends up suppressing oxygen vacancy formation, and so then we end up uh, oftentimes supercooling, and so uh, the effect of doping is really really interesting. So uh, doping, this is our first indication that doping provides us a means of not just changing the thermodynamic transformation temperature, but also through modulation of the oxygen vacancy concentration, we can change the, the hysteresis um, in the material. Um, and now, uh, tungsten is great. This is a great model system, but it's the wrong way. Um, we want to push this transformation temperature up so that we can get to, you know, temperatures more, more um, common to data science, uh, data centers and such. And so we, um, worked on germanium, which pushes the transmission temperature quite, quite high. We can go a little bit higher than this too, but close to about 85, 90 degrees. And, and so again, this is a beautiful example of where you can push the, the, the equilibrium transmission temperature up, the high temp, the heating transformation is not so affected by, um, uh, by anything uh, because, because it's nucleated at phase boundaries and, and twin faults, but the cooling transformation is extremely sensitive to the oxygen vacancy concentration. So by, by tuning uh, uh, the, the uh, alloying uh, element and the oxygen vacancy concentration, uh, we can disentangle the hysteresis of the transformation from the transformation temperature, right? So when, uh, again, germanium suppresses oxygen vacancy concentration, um, if we are in an oxygen poor environment, we still have sufficient oxygen vacancies so we can sort of drive uh, the, the transformation without too much uh, super cooling. If we uh, are under a relatively oxygen rich environment, we have a very, very low concentration of oxygen vacancies. And so we are able to very nicely um, um, suppress the transformation temperature. So that's, uh, that's, a, that's a, a nice set of um, levers, chemical levers to tune transformation characteristics. Um, I'll tell you about one more, um, uh, I don't know, my time is limited, so I'll tell you about one more mechanism that, that uh, we found that's super interesting. Uh, we, can, we did some um, RTA um, allo uh, uh, doping of boron. Boron's too small to sit in the vanadium side, uh, tungsten and, and uh, germanium sit in vanadium sides, but boron sits in an, in an interstitial side. And here's the interesting thing, the interstitial side that where boron sits is different in the two phases of VO2, in the monoclinic and rutile phase. So um, as you heat up uh, boron doped VO2 and you pull it down, uh, you end up seeing that uh, it starts to, and then you, when, you, when you cool it down, it, the boron is trapped in an unfavorable site and starts to diffuse. And, and as it diffuses, the structure relaxes. So as a function of time, the, the, tra the uh, transformation temperature uh, uh, edges upwards. And, and this is, uh, it depends sensitively. So uh, uh, as on a function of, of uh, how long it's been sitting at a certain temperature and what temperature that is, it's an extremely, extremely nonlinear behavior. And, and so again, we've done a lot of soft X-ray zines. This is at the CLS, where we were able to look at boron local environment. And, and it, again, it sort of, uh, when you cool it down, it's stuck in this unfavorable three coordinate sites, uh, and then it relaxes to an approximately tetrahedral site um, you know, over a period of time. And so, really, this is super interesting because boron definitely then is a is a real um, uh, clock. It's an, a boron dope VO2 is a clock and a thermometer, and the transition temperature encodes both time and temperature since the material was was last reset. Um, and this this opens up. Uh, possibilities for lots of interesting uh, devices uh, that we've had fun playing with, uh, particularly my, my uh, colleague Patrick Schamberger and um, Adelaide Bradisich and his group. Uh, and you can see beautiful analog-like sta staircases, and we can move these around depending on the thermal history of the samples. And, and that, again, lots of, lots of great potential for, uh, yeah, almost uh, accessing multiple internal states for doing, doing uh, neuromorphic computing. So, this is this is uh, some work of the, on VO two, and uh, I know I have probably maybe three more minutes left, right? So I'll I'll rush through. I'll talk about some of our single crystal work um, that that we focused on. And again, the idea here is is okay. We've, we've seen a lot of pin film devices, but um, if you really 
our, our dream is to watch every atom as they as it moves and and to have a full understanding of electronic structure right um across a, 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 a neuromorphic transition so we took beta prime copper v205 we can grow nanowires but we can also grow single crystals of these and and beautiful uh, uh system not as sharp as as uh vo2 but 150 to 390 kelvin you can get uh voltage and current in these transformations and what we can do is we do single crystal diffraction as a function of temperature, right? And, and we can see uh, what happens. In, in, this is the structure, copper in, inside the V205 tunnels. Uh, there's a very small um, volume expansion, so very low lattice involvement. And what happens at 110 Kelvin, uh, there's some split side disorder. Copper sits on uh, one side closer to one vanadium atom or another one. But at higher temperatures, copper starts to really uh, be delocalized across these two, uh, these two uh, sites. And then as a result, copper is plus one, the vanadium I, uh, centers are reduced. And so when, when you've got this, this cation shuttling going on, you also have uh, polarons uh, oscillating on the V205 lattice. This is some uh, uh, photo emission spectroscopy, the ALS, and some RICs also done at the ALS that really shows uh, um, some of the more, more details of the transformation and in the copper uh, uh, um, occupancy changes as a function, function of temperature. And, and uh, we, can, we can see the start. And so this is a quick AI MD simulation. So the structural distortion is very, very small. Copper, uh, instead of sitting, being localized in one side, being spreading out across two sides, and then that induces a very large electronic transition once you've got enough of this. And then depending on how much copper you have in the structure, the transformation temperature is, is tunable. So this was a, a, a fun um, study. And, and now this is a new uh, yet unpublished material, which is, is a similar mechanism, but, but different. And here we've actually built single crystal uh, neuromorphic oscillators. And, and what, what we end up seeing is copper actually uh, there's a huge uh, reordering of copper, not a, not a huge, I would say a subtle reordering of a super lattice uh, in single crystals. And, and again, I think uh, this is a, a perfect system for some beautiful measurements with our colleagues at, at APS who have an amazing arsenal of tools. And this is again, a single crystal measurement, pretty large, large transformation, 150 Kelvin or so. We can, we, we can tune this tr uh, transformation temperature a bit as well. I'll show you uh, uh, maybe, uh, uh, just before I end, so this is we can we can actually map supercell reflections and they actually decrease and it's exactly coincident with this with the copper uh, MIT as well and and we've got some AIMD simulations that um, essentially show that the copper has to migrate um, between between uh, two sides to disrupt the supercell ordering. So I think that's all I have time for. But um, what I've tried to talk to you about here is that we have a lot of uh, interesting materials, including single crystals that are available um, that I think could be very good model systems and really have interesting properties. And, and this is our, our approach as, as chemists. We, we, we start with large structures. We can say Jenga, right? We can put, pull, pull out ions, put in other ions. And this gives us a, a powerful means of establishing real structure function correlations. And, and this is an example where we take this, this structure that I showed you with copper and, and Joe Handy was able to put in uh, lithium ions in, in four distinctive sites of, of, the, of the material. So I think that's all I have time for. I'm gonna stop here and be happy to take any, any questions. Uh, thank you so much again for the invitation. Um, I, I have a, I, I, I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah, yeah I can hear you, go ahead. Uh, okay, my name, my name is Joe Asquin, and I'm actually a trained neurochemist, and, and I have also taught neuroembryology at the medical school, and so uh, I'm an engineer also, but, but, but the idea, I'm humbled by what uh, you just presented in terms of how you can reconstruct and, and focus on some aspects of neural conduction and electrical connection uh, from potentially one synapse to the next. Um, I think, you know, obviously it's a lot more complex in the, in the brain. And then one thing that I should mention 
the the brain conduction or neural conduction is one thing, but what makes it a, a unique system is modulation. Not all the cells are excited at the same time, and then also the uh, electrical conduction from two from one cell to the next is modulated by a variety of different things. The neurotransmitters, the amount of packets of information that are delivered. And then also uh, there is a, a very important element, uh, which is the myelin and glia cells that actually modulate the, uh, the uh, influx, if you want, or the, uh, or the stimulation. Without yeah, that's that, yeah. I'm sorry, go yeah, ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. I would say without that, you just have a straight connection. And, and um, uh, basically it's an electrical connection, which is actually not what happens in the brain. Uh, it, go ahead, I, I, that is just my, my comment. Yeah, no, that's a, great, that's a great comment. So we're much more primitive right now compared to the brain, but mm -hmm. you're exactly right that the energy efficiency of the brain derives from uh, sending packets of information, right, uh, to, to mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, and this is sort of what's crudely depicted in my, in my cartoon here, right, is, yeah. is packets are coming in and you're either, yeah, exactly, amplifying, mm -hmm. right, and, and that's exactly uh, the, the, the type of system we're trying to build, and, and so when you saw, you know, for instance, so the boron diffus diffusing across is, is, is really the system uh, getting a, a, a means of telling time or, 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 or temperature or, or responding mm -hmm. to an, an external influx uh, uh, about of whether or not, or what should it do next, right? And, and yeah. so what it's trying to reflect is, is memory, right? Which is, uh, so, and this is, I think, what makes these circuits different from conventional circuits or conventional, you know, or silicon circuits is the memoristive aspect of it. The fact that it knows what it's, or, or it, and that's what gives it, gives it some crude, uh, again, still very crude because, because of course, you know, there's, I mean, there's a lot of nuance in this that I, I didn't get a chance to talk about, but, uh, you know, uh, still very crude, but it gives it a, a sense of, well, an event happened in the, and your, your device changed in response to that and remembers yeah. what it saw, at least for the time being, right? And, and then that, that provides a mechanism to process the next signal in a manner that re, you know, remembers 15 signals before it or, or, or so on and so forth. And, that, and, that, and that's where we are at now, which is nowhere near the uh, complexity yeah. of where we need to be for, yeah. uh, uh, you know, so this is where we are at now is still much more energy efficient than uh, digital computing. Yeah, because yeah. of the reason that you just said is that uh, you're very, you're being very, very efficient, very uh, parsimonious with mm -hmm. what is being fired, right? And, and the, the rest of the circuit's not really doing anything the entire time, right? Yeah. So well, one thing I, I could very briefly mention is that you know, I have seen electrical uh, models like that. And I think a lot of people are looking postsynaptic, the event postsynaptic. And I think that even in your model, you could add something to modulate the, if you want the, the simulation of the packet of information prior to the, the electrical activity. Yeah, yeah, and that's a, that's a great point. So Alec Kalin, who's a Sandia, is doing some great work with building out uh, synapses using, uh, um, you know, proton diffusion or lithium diffusion, right? And and mm -hmm. he, can, he can control that as a as a sort of a third parameter, right? So it's those, those mm -hmm. are two terminal devices that he can control using. Uh, um, so he's part of, of Remind as well, and and uh, using a uh, uh, sort of an ionic gate, then you, that gives you another uh, degree, and then you could switch the circuits, but so that they are either functioning in this neuronal mode, or uh, you know you have some synaptic element to them, and then and then you can go back and forth. And and this is why, uh, from a material property, um, I'd love to have right 
because that because the brain is powerful and can do some interesting things. Not just two states here, like I've shown here, but three or four, and 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 that's part of what we're trying to to get to. So then you can post modulate between entirely different regimes, and and you can get a lot more versatility out of that same circuit element. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I, I I think there are a variety of maybe we we can we can do that in another forum. Uh, you have my name and address so over yes. there. If you'd like to talk more about this, I think that as you develop new materials, you may want to look at how the brain actually works in terms of the interaction between cells and non neurons and non neuronal cells and myelin, which is another element that you can modulate as well, you can include into in your model. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and that's exactly right. So these are, you know, and what I talked today, almost everything I talked about was just building a neuron. And, and then yes. we've got synapses, and then we've got dendrites, which are also also have an important role. And then you've got the myelin. Yeah, so, so all of this has to has to come together. Yeah. I think I think neural activity has been you know uh, detected and measured you know in the 40s, so we know how one neuron communicates with another, and you can mimic that. Right. What has not been done to this day is how to modulate the the signal. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> and this still has this to be done. <laughs> Alex Alex work is really I think critical. In, in yeah. terms of uh, uh, connecting uh, to or and and yeah and so uh, right and, and you know and there's some good models that my colleague uh, Stan Williams has also built uh, is building of interactions between two chaotic amplifiers for instance yeah yeah how they how they talk to each other right and Very and uh, and there's some really uh, uh, complex math that that there is to, to how those interact and and uh understanding that has been uh you know there's there's a role for ml tools and such and understanding how they start uh connecting and it's it's very non-trivial like you said you know to, oh, to look at the look at look at even even a system of four oscillators is is, is very very non-trivial mm -hmm. uh, absolutely and and one final comment is and this is how i i used to teach uh, neuro uh, science if you want is through neuroembryology you want to see how the cells are put together initially and there's no connection yet there the cells are in place but there's no connection and eventually there will be connection there will be connection and so yes. what happened what, what what makes that happen if we can understand that i think that electronically we would be much further ahead Right, and I don't know if Joshua Young's here yet, but Joshua Young has done some beautiful work uh, on, um, uh, you know, on, on exactly this, on, on, you know, how do you electroform new connections, for instance? Yes, exactly. Uh, and and exactly. How you, the electroforming of new connections, how that drives logic, uh, you know, so that so there's a there's some interesting ideas there. Proceed. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was a very interesting talk, and I wish you luck in 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 thank all you. these endeavors. Take thank care. You. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, the uh, the 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 thanks thanks your question and uh, thanks uh, uh, subject uh, the very exciting talk. So yeah, let's uh, probably because of timing, so we have to want to follow you know, the schedule to go to the next uh, speaker. But yeah, we have uh, some break in the middle. So maybe we can have uh, some few questions, you know, question or follow up if anybody have any question to the to the speaker. So, okay, so let's uh, move uh, to our next uh, talk from Hua Jun. Hua Jun, can you, maybe you can open your mic and the camera and uh, just last sharing screen, so. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can hear. Okay. Uh, well, okay. So yeah, you can start it. Like, let me introduce, you know, the next speaker. Okay. So our next uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Hua Jun Liu from uh, Singapore. Is uh, from the uh, the A Star, the Agency for Science Technology Research, A Star from Singapore. So uh, also a, a short background for Hua Jun. Hua Jun uh, right now is a senior scientist and group leader and the a star for the you know also the institute of material research engineer i think, believe that's within a star 
So Hua Jun got his PhD from uh, National University of Singapore in 2012. And then he, you know, uh, worked at, uh, at the A-Star and also AUS for, uh, you know, about two years. And then especially he got a, uh, uh, the government fellowship uh, for post visiting post at Argonne and uh, from 2014 to, you know, uh, 16 before he, go, you know, uh, uh, going back. And then he read, uh, uh, oh, he worked as a scientist and also engineer, at both A-Star and applied material uh, for and you know uh, from 16 to uh, uh, you know 2020, and then he right now promoting to the group leader senior scientist for A star work on this uh, oxide uh, thing too. I think his his group focus on developing next generation function oxide or changing the future information technology. So, you know especially especially uh, they're aim, aim, you know, aiming to developing oxide thing film for acoustic you know acoustic uh, filter in 5G 6, 6G wireless network artificial uh, synapse in neural for computing and low power sensor uh, in internet of things. Okay, go ahead, Huajun. Okay, yeah. Thank you, Huai, for your introduction. And yeah, thank you for invite for this talk. Yeah, I, I'm going to share our recent work on, and it's also going, uh, this is also recently found project on developing high performance uh, piezoelectric oxidizing films for acoustic filters in 5G wireless communication. Okay, so as we all know, this uh, like Internet of Things, the Industry 4.0 concept is quite a hot topic right now. I think it critically depends on the connectivity of all the physical objects. Uh, is, is that you're talking about edge computing or connectivity for sensors actuators in the IoT platform? So the connectivity is actually uh, these, that the link that makes everything uh, work together and make the system smart. So yeah, so the wireless communication is one of the key hardware foundation for all those uh, applications. So if we look at the development of wireless communication from uh, third generation, fourth generation, now everybody talking about fifth generation and the future sixth generation. So the, the, if you look at the uh, data transfer speed for 5, 4G, actually we're in the range of 75 megabyte per second to about one gigabyte per second. So actually we haven't reached this speed if you check your mobile phones, uh, uh, the data rate. I think in most of the uh, area now we don't have this speed yet. So it's actually, we haven't go really to 5G yet. So there's some, um, limitations from the uh, hardware. So this is uh, what we're going to talk about today. So if we look at the radio frequency from N in our handphones, so it basically consists of this antennas, some switches, then it's the important function is this filter. Then you also have the power amplifier or some no noise amplifiers to, uh, to process the signals. So the filters actually serve the function to uh, basically block out the unwanted frequency bands, this uh, stop bands, and only pass through those uh, carrier frequencies where your signal is carried over in the electromagnetic wave. So because of the high uh, quality factor and also the small size of the acoustic filters, so it's actually uh, widely used for the mobile communications. So basically what they did is they convert electromagnetic wave into a mechanical vibration so to feel out the frequency bands. So the mechanical vibration, because it's uh, the resonance frequency of this mechanical vibration is very sharp. It's very well controlled by your uh, device design and your property of the uh, piezoelectric materials. So basically the idea is that uh, if you want to get a higher speed of data rate to, in order to achieve the low latency, Let's say for future autonomous vehicles, you need a low latency uh, wireless network. So the important thing is to get a wider bandwidth so that you have a higher data transfer rate. So basically this is uh, by showing by sh uh, Shannon information theory. So basically the data information, the transfer rate is proportional to the number of channels you have and the uh, bandwidth of your of your each channel and also uh, signal to noise ratio. So basically, if you want to uh, have a higher uh, speed wireless communication, you need a wide bandwidth of these uh, filters. Okay, 
So this is the uh, roughly the market size. It's quite big market, and a lot of uh, companies are looking at developing uh, filters with a better performance, uh, such as wide bandwidth, and also operating at higher frequency for the uh, 5G and 6G network. Okay, so if we look at the uh, state-of-the-art acoustic filters in the market, so this is a summary of all the uh, different kind of devices. So for uh, previous generations like 3G or 2G uh, wireless network, what they use is uh, so-called uh, surface acoustic wave resonators. So it's basically a, a piezoelectric single crystal like uh, lithium nowbit or lithium tantalate. So you use single crystal piezoelectric uh, then you pattern some interdigital electrodes on the surface to generate the uh, acoustic waves on the surface of the crystal. So those actually uh, have some limitations that you cannot go very high frequency because of the uh, pat the finger width of this uh, uh, of these patterns of these interdigital electrodes. So there's some uh, limitations of this performance. Uh, another thing is that people have been developing the temperature compensated. Uh, saw to uh, to get a better temperature stability over a, a wider working uh, temperature range. So this has been uh, developed by these companies. Uh, so now, uh, as we move on to high frequency and high bandwidth, those three are the major. Uh, these two actually is a major um, device architecture. So uh, it's. It's, it's diff based on different uh, acoustic wave vibration modes. So this is surface acoustic wave, and these two are the uh, bulk acoustic wave. So basically the acoustic wave propagate in the vertical direction instead of the in-plane direction. So here you have a piezoelectric, uh, instead of single crystal, now you have sync films. And these sync films has been sandwiched between top and bottom electrode. And the important thing is that you have to make a cavity below this, uh, these sandwiched layers so that the the resonance is uh, strong and clean and uh, has a wide bandwidth. Uh, so one this is called F-bar structure where you have a cavity here. And then another structure is that you can have a multi-layer uh, structure which is uh, designed to reflect the acoustic wave back to your uh, device so that the acoustic wave is uh, re the resonance is being confined in your film without leaking to the substrates. So this is another design by some other companies. So both those two technologies the uh, uh, dominant one now in the market for the uh, bulk wave bulk wave resonators. So the material uh, being used for this is aluminum nitride thin films. So this is the uh, industry uh, dominant design and materials. And then recently there's a company called Resonant. So they've designed this X-bar geometry where it's also kind of a bulk wave resonator, but it's with a simpler structure because uh, it only uses uh, the top electrodes, the patterns to excite the waves. Uh, so they use this lithium now bit thin plates. So these are not thin films because this actually uh, being uh, using some kind of technology called smart cut to uh, transfer a very thin layer of lithium nubbit from the single crystals. And then you put it on silicon oxide, silicon wafers. So this also have a cavity on the backside. So this device actually can have a much higher operation frequency and much wide bandwidth. So this is uh, a new architecture. I believe it has not been uh, mass produced yet. So these two are actually what we use uh, in a lot of high-end uh, mobile uh, communication products. Okay, so as material scientists, we always look at uh, what material is, uh, what, what we can do uh, in the material improvement. So if you look at uh, these two um, classic material for this application of acoustic filters, the first one is aluminum nitride. So this is uh, the uh, polar structure of aluminum and nitrogen. Uh, so this is a simple crystal structure and this is just piezoelectric. It's not a ferroelectric, so that means the polarization is not switchable by electric field. So this actually leads to a good stability of the device and it's not sensitive to the uh, temperature or other ter uh, stimuli. And the the major advantage of aluminum nitricing film is that uh, the ma ma the manufacturing, the large scale deposition is very mature. So basically uh, what industry did using uh, PVD growth is basically you need a, 
aluminum metal target, and then you put in some nitrogen gas so it will form a aluminum nitride on the silicon substrate. And this is the most compatible process and uh, it's being uh, massively produced. However, the problem for this material is that the piezoelectric coefficient is very small. If you look at the D33, it's only 3.5 or less than uh, 4. And the electromechanical coupling coefficient is also quite small. So this actually uh, limits the bandwidth. So the bandwidth is actually proportional to this uh, electromechanical coupling coefficient, which is also related to the piezoelectric coefficients. So intrinsically, this material is uh, not have strong response in piezoelectric behavior. And some some industry uh, research and developing uh, teams are looking at doping some elements such as scanning in this material to improve these properties. So that's one direction uh, they're trying right now. And the second type of uh, material as we're talking about now is uh, just now is a lithium now bit. So lithium now bit have this uh, quite interesting hexagonal lattice where you have uh, niobium sitting at the center of this oxygen octahedra, then the next octahedra have lithium in the center, then the third octahedra actually they have uh, empty uh, atoms, so it's empty, there's no atoms in the center. Then you repeat with niobium, lithium, empty. So it's kind of a spatial uh, structure. Uh, the the de device performance, just now we're talking about the X-bar structure, has been very uh, amazing performance for this uh, X-bar structure at very high uh, resonance frequencies. So uh, it's because of the performance, piezoelectric performance of lithium now is better than aluminum nitride. But the major problem for this material system is that direct growth of lithium now based thin film is uh, very challenging. And uh, most of the device demonstrated right now is using this called uh, smart card technology. So you, you, you transfer the a thin layer from the silicon wafers and then transfer uh, from the box single crystal then you transfer to the silicon wafers and then you do this uh, nanofabrications for to get this device okay now in, in addition to the bandwidth another uh, desirable property for these filters is the frequency tunability so uh, this is an old design, what I can get from some of the papers. Uh, it's basically for each uh, frequency band in a phone, you need a, a separate uh, uh, filters because all the filter frequencies are fixed when uh, after you uh, make them in the device. So basically for the old generations, you already have more than like 28 filters in order to have uh, all your mobile uh, wireless communications to work. Okay, now if you look at the more recent phones, so this is a, a, a trend uh, for for the 4G and future 5G phones. So nowadays you have around uh, like iPhone, previous generation iPhone has like 60 to, 60 to 80 uh, acoustic filters. And then as you uh, have increasing operation band and more functions as you add into these phones. There is predicted to be more than 100 filters in the phone. Uh, so actually, if you have a tunable frequency band, I think it's possible to uh, reduce the number of filters. It may not be ideal to reduce all the filters into one or two, but it can reduce the number of filters in the in the uh, hardware so that uh, the cost and the design may, uh, is, is, is easier and the cost is lower. So that's another motivation is to try to get a frequency tunable acoustic filters. Okay, so for our uh, research, we want to utilize the film we recently uh, discovered is on sodium nanobate, nanopillar thin films. So as compared to other aluminum nitride, uh, even scanning dope aluminum nitride and lithium now bit, our piezoelectric coefficient is uh, huge, actually much higher than all these materials. It's about uh, one to 200 times higher. So this has a great potential to achieve uh, wide bandwidth. And for the frequency tunability, because of uh, the aluminum nitride material is not uh, ferroelectric, so it has no tunable uh, frequency because it basically the polarization is not uh, switchable by the field. And lithium now bait and the barium strontium titanate show some tunability, but uh, we believe based on the uh, field dependent piezoelectric behavior of our film, we think we have we should able to reach much higher tunable uh, frequency range. 
Okay, now let's go to the uh, our material system. So uh, before that, uh, let me introduce one kind of defect in perovskite oxides. Uh, it's called anti-site defect. So basically, in ABO3 perovskite structure, you can have the case where um, the A site atoms can sit on B site position or B site sitting on A site position. Uh, depends on the stoichiometry. Okay, so one case uh, example is like in strontium titanite zinc films, you can have a film with strontium vacancy so that the extra titanium uh, can occupy the strontium position, but because of the smaller ionic size of titanium, it cannot actually effectively bond with all the oxygen so it to shift into an off-center dis uh, placement displaced position. So this actually gives rise to local uh, ferroelectric polarizations. And this actually is responsible for uh, this ferroelectric polarization observing this uh, film, which is otherwise is a pyroelectric uh, film. So similar phenomena have been found in other material systems such as uh, atrium ferrite. So this uh, atrium occupying uh, iron position also can give rise some uh, ferroelectric uh, behavior in this system. So what we our idea is trying to use these anti-site defects to introduce a uh, higher piezoelectric and ferroelectric behavior in sodium now based system. So uh, this is a well-known system in so-called lead-free piezoelectric materials. So because the conventional piezoelectric zinc film uh, material, the most well-known is the lead zirconium titanite, PZT, but because of the lead uh, content in the material is very high, so it's uh, being uh, going to be banned by the uh, some uh, like EU regulations. So people are developing lead-free piezoelectric materials. So these are the three major lead-free systems. So uh, potassium, sodium, nalbate is one of the uh, leading candidates because of high uh, piezoelectric coefficient and high curie temperature. So this uh, this is formed by uh, a kind of a morphic polymorphic phase boundary between potassium nalbate and sodium nalbate. So at this particular composition, you can have an enhanced piezoelectric response. So, but the challenge in this uh, material system is that uh, people are trying to dope uh, more elements in this uh, material to in improve the piezoelectric coefficient. So this at the price uh, comes at the price of very complicated chemical compositions. This is actually uh, very difficult to uh, reproduce. And another uh, side effect is that when you dope a lot of elements in this system, your cure temperature is keep dropping because you are breaking the original uh, lattice of this uh, material. So, um, so another common phenomena in this high uh, piezoelectric coefficient material is that you have very fine nanostructural heterogeneity uh, and also some polar uh, domains in this material. There's actually some simulation shows that if you have a finer domains, you can have a higher response of piezoelectric uh, properties. So we are thinking, can we emulate this kind of behavior without using complicated uh, chemical doping? So in our work, we actually grow this uh, film uh, on strontium titanate substrate, STU single crystal substrate. So this is a uh, film with uh, close to stoichiometry sodium nalbate 113. So this is a lattice of, from TEM images, just a very typical perovskite lattice. Uh, in case, in the case when we uh, reduce the sodium concentration, you can form this kind of a self-assembled nanopillar structure. And this is a detailed uh, atomic resolution. So it actually looks like you have another set of lattice, which is shifted uh, vertically and horizontally. And, this is the based on our understanding. This is because we have a uh, this nanopillar structure is um, distributing this matrix. So that's why we have seen uh, the extra column of atoms is because of the nanopillars uh, overlapping when you're seeing from uh, certain angles. And from plan view, you can see they have uh, pillars of different uh, sizes of different. Uh, so this also. Uh, Agree with our cross-section view of the shifting of the lattices in the in the cell. Okay, we also did the X-ray diffraction. So with so this for, for film without uh, nanopillars, it's it's like a tetragonal structure. But with the nanopillar structures, there's more distortions to lower the symmetry into a monoclinic structure. And we also did temperature-dependent study to determine the curie temperature by 
monitoring the lattice parameters, function temperature, and also the uh, octahedral tilt. So this also agree with the uh, electrical prop, uh, dielectric constant testing. So it, we we are able to maintain the high cool temperature of the system, as we don't introduce a lot of dopants. And then uh, with this uh, film, we, we measure the piezoelectric coefficient using the laser scanning vibrometer. Basically, we apply electric field and we measure the uh, strain, the displacement under the electrode. So for, for the film without pillar structure, it's uh, quite normal piezoelectric coefficient. And it's also almost independent of the electric field you applied. However, with this uh, nanopillar structure, you can get a very high, uh, like 50 times higher piezoelectric coefficient. And this piezoelectric coefficient is actually quite dependent on the field. That's why we think uh, it's quite promising. Maybe we can use this film for the uh, frequency tunable uh, devices. Okay, then we have some uh, theoretical simulations to uh, really show us that with uh, sodium deficient concentration uh, condition, you have uh, the formation of this kind of defect. Uh, and then this similar story as we, we show in strontium titanate, the niobium atoms is much smaller than sodium. So once you have this anti-site defect, anti-site atoms get to uh, the low energy position is actually not at the center, but as to shift uh, in the unicell. So this contributes to the local uh, polarization in the films. And then we also have the phase field simulation to uh, help us to understand the uh, like the boundary contribution. So the area with the, uh, at the boundary between the pillars and the matrix actually shows a stronger strain response on the electric field. Okay, then uh, if we look at the performance of this film compared with other material system, so we are able to achieve a much higher piezoelectric coefficient and at the same time we maintain the uh, curie temperature. Okay, then uh, if we compare with other thin films, we have uh, simpler compositions. So that's also an advantage. Okay, then uh, in the following up work, we actually look at more detail of this uh, domain of the uh, boundary between the pillars and the uh, matrix. We see uh, all ki different kinds of the uh, arrangement, and also some of them are uh, charged and strained. And uh, in another work, we also see looking at the uh, density effect of density of these boundaries. So basically, when you have a high density, you can e even further increase the uh, physiologic response. Okay, so uh, this actually is related to uh, one last slide about the uh, X-ray part. So what we want to design is like we want to bring this device into synchrotron to do the in situ X-ray diffraction on electric field to understand uh, how the lattice. So actually, the lattice change is quite uh, the the strain response is very huge. So we want to understand how uh, is this coming from pure lattice uh, change or is there's a exchanging like domain wall rotation these kind of things. So this is uh, well my staff put up this uh, schematics to uh, try to using a micro size or even nano size, uh, nanometer size beam to look at our device and uh, to see uh, electric field induced uh, phase transitions or, or the structure change on the electric field. And another thing is that uh, because our device is going to work at uh, around gigahertz uh, frequency range, I think there's also possibility to use like the time resolved uh, X-ray diffraction to look at some of the uh, dynamics in these uh, resonator devices. Okay, uh, I think uh, that's my uh, conclusion. So I think uh, I have shared with you that the developing high performance piezoelectric sync films is uh, quite critical to achieve wide bandwidth acoustic filters for the high speed communication, wireless communication. And then the current uh, materials used is uh, one is aluminum nitride uh, and lithium nitride. So basically both of them have their uh, weakness which need to overcome to deliver the high performance device for, for the great demand in the uh, wireless communication. And we believe our material is a good candidate with the potential to achieve both uh, wide bandwidth and the frequency tunability for these uh, acoustic field applications. So finally, I want to uh, thank uh, the fun the funding agencies, uh, National Research Foundation in Singapore and also our uh, ESTA 
Agency for Science Technology uh, Research. So we recently get this uh, competitive research program. It's about uh, 9 million US dollars so for five years. We're going to focusing on this topic. Uh, so this is, uh, I also want to thank my group members for their contribution. And this is my email. We uh, welcome any sort of collaborations or working together in this uh, very interesting and challenging area. And also work with uh, X-ray uh, to, to look at some of the mechanisms. Okay, thank you for your attention. Yeah, thanks, Hua Jun. Thanks, uh, Hua Jun's uh, talk on the uh, acoustic filter material for the 5G 60. So is there any questions you can directly open mic or just uh, put your question, you see any question for that? So uh, yeah, I, I have a question, Wa. Yeah, Isn't go it? ahead, go ahead. Yeah, hello, Roger, good to see yeah, you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how did you know that this would phase separate into nano pillars? I guess I missed that part. Yeah, actually we, we don't know how, why, uh, we didn't expect this to happen. It's just uh, what we observed after we 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 changed the stoichiometry of the of this material. So it's kind of a self assembly process, I believe. Okay. Do you have a prediction for other systems like it, or you think this is uh, the one system that it may occur in? Yeah, actually, we uh, with the help of the DFT calculations and some other simulations, we we're looking at other systems like. Uh, uh, this is uh, like one plus five plus uh, system, right? This is uh, yeah. now. Be, so we are looking at some other systems, like maybe uh, two plus four plus system or three plus three plus system. We're we're trying to see. Uh, so we have another project ongoing, trying to explore whether this is a general phenomena for uh, prof sky oxide or this is a very special one for this system. So I think. Uh, oh, we we have some idea. We're just still trying to to see how the the get some experimental data on this. Okay, but but the pillars are sort of made from anti site defects, so it has to do with anti site energy. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I believe so. Okay. So so actually, the ordering of the of the especially at the boundaries. So if you look at this uh, this figure. Yeah, so actually this, um, the ordering changed when you go to this uh, pillar region is actually, this position is originally should be sodium position, but this, so what we see here are all niobium atoms because the sodium is too light to be seen by this uh, TM image. Yeah. So this are uh, niobium atoms and then, so this is originally should be sodium position, but inside this region, the so niobium is actually, uh, occupying the original sodium position, so especially the boundary, there's a there's a change. I think it's because of uh, chemical driven, the stoichiometry driven. Uh, so so because you have too many niobiums and not enough sodium in the system, so the no niobium has to go to somewhere. It, it it can go to the original sodium position. Okay, and you can you can tune the size of these things by changing composition. Yes, yes, that's what we did uh, in this, uh, I think this uh, last year's nature communication work. So, okay. yeah. I think, okay. Okay, yeah, this, cool. this one, yeah. So basically if you put, uh, this is potassium sodium now, bit, but it's, I think the concept is the same. It's just, uh, you, you put more, uh, you, you reduce the uh, A-site concentration. Basically you can reduce more uh, the density, high density of the boundaries. Okay. And then give you a stronger response. Uh, yeah, so so Dylan, so this uh, uh, non-composite uh, way, well, I mean, the forming the, the this kind of pillar, it may be a little bit uh, uh, limited to nail-based system, but uh, forming this non-composite self-sample, I think is quite, uh, how can I say that? You know, quite often, you know, often be seen. I think that a few different groups already tried a similar mm -hmm. idea of uh, lead titanium oxide and the barium titanium oxide, but they they're not like the anti side way. They're just using their uh, primary oxide, like a lead oxide or barium oxide, forming a, another phase as a as an intrusion. Also enhance a lot this uh, uh, DC three you know uh, coefficients. 
But yeah, nanopeeler like uh, when the Huajun show is right now probably more unique for nail bases. Well, it, it's nice because I guess the interfaces are not full of dislocations, right? It seems that's to right. be that's, that's right. really that's right. clean right. interface. It's a, yeah, yeah. It's a it seems the uh, yeah, lattice is quite coherent, actually. This is, a, I think, it's an amazing part. So if you look at the lattice between matrix and uh, the pillars, they're actually very coherent. There's yeah, no, yeah. no much, uh, yeah like the this distortions yeah so well right. maybe one reason why their performance you know much better than the other tribe for like a lead titanium oxide or or a barren right. titanium yeah. so any more questions for the Okay, I will have a very quick question, Hua uh, Jun. So, so uh, because of this uh, nano Peter really forming look like uh, uh, it's pretty coherent in other interface, but their location wide is not really like a highly order, right? It's still pretty random distribute, right? Uh, yes, uh, yes. Uh, if, are those gonna affect? View. Yeah, I, I, yeah. You can see from TM. Are those gonna affect the the device, the cluster device? You know, or or, 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 you know, uh, this won't be an issue for the acoustic device. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically, if the size of this uh, is about a few nanometers, so the scale yeah. by is five nanometers. Yeah, yeah. So I think the acoustic wavelength uh, is much larger than this. So okay. possibly, I think it's, uh, it's, there's no difference to the acoustic waves. Okay. Yeah, that's what we, I was understanding. I we, we hope to control this ge uh, size and the, uh, but it's quite difficult. It's, it's, I think it's like a self-assembled process. Yeah, okay. So maybe our comment briefly, this is your, uh, I think this might actually be quite common in ferroelectrics and other materials. And this type of uh, self-assembly might actually be exciting and what we want to understand, right? Yeah. Mm. yeah yes. Are there any more questions or comments? If not, you know, we maybe move uh, to our next speaker, but uh, I think Yue, you, you want to take over. Sure, I'll uh, do that. Yep, yeah, go ahead. Thanks, okay. um, thanks. Uh, so our next speaker is Dr. Suman, uh, Dr. Ani Suman. Uh, Ani is now the group leader for the Nano Fabrication Devices Group at CNM of Argan. He obtained his PhD at the University of Hume, India, and joined Argon as a postdoc, and then returned to Argon as a staff scientist. He is an expert in carbon-based materials, including CBD graphene, carbon nanotubes, and focused on the fabrication of energy-efficient uh, MEMS and NEMS devices. He is a member of the advisory board of the National Graphene Association and has won the R&D 100 award in 2011, 2013, 2014, and the National Innovation Award for 2016, 17, 18. He is also devoted to the STM education, including giving one of the TED Talks here in, in Naperville, if I recall. So, Ani, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you for a wonderful introduction. And uh, can you see my slides and hear me well? Yes, yes, thank you. Okay, great. Yeah, I mean, uh, first of all, congratulations to all the organizers. I think, uh, you know, from yesterday, even though I couldn't, you know, had much time to look at many of the talks, but I think uh, it's been really wonderful workshop you guys have put together and uh, covering various aspects, you know, in the microelectronics, uh, materials, characterization and measurements. So, uh, I think today uh, I'm going to focus on uh, some of the uh, the work we have been doing uh, on the diamond. And since I'm a material scientist, you know, my approach here is mostly on the uh, material integration side. Uh, we do collaborate with electrical engineers, uh, but, uh, you know, my approach will be mostly on the materials aspect. And uh, uh, that's what I'm going to, you know, focus mostly. And, and um, when I talk about the hetero integration, this is, uh, you know, most of the things in the passive area and then towards the end, I'm going to talk about some of the interesting results in the, you know, active integration. So, uh, you know, Argon is, a, is a, you know, well known uh, for doing research in the various carbon materials, in particular CNM, since its inception, uh, you know, in 2006. Uh, there is a lot of work 
that we have been doing in the diamond and uh, also in graphene area, uh, also collaboration with various industries, startup uh, that actually, you know, uh, basically uh, work with various areas with us on the diamond aspect. And uh, uh, I think it, it's a really interesting journey, you know, from uh, last 15, 16 years, I think, in this area. But let me quickly get on to the, you know, diamond. So diamond is ideally, you know, is one of the, uh, I think, you know, good ultra wideband gap semiconductor material. But, uh, you know, there have been a lot of progress in the last decade or so, but uh, I'm just going to talk a few things where, you know, diamond has progress and where, you know, more uh, research is needed. So, of course, the high thermal conductivity is, is uh, you know, very important. And as you can see that, you know, diamond has uh, almost, you know, five times higher thermal conductivity than copper and then almost 22 times higher than the, you know, silicon. Also, when it comes to the uh, high dielectric strength, uh, which is very important, of course, for the power electronics application, you know, diamond has a very high dielectric strength of 10 to the 6, you know, uh, volts per centimeter. So for a comparison, if you look at, you know, the silicon, you will have to take about, you know, about a thousand micron or so uh, to isolate about 10,000 volts, but you need, uh, if you have diamonds, about just, you know, 20 microns. So, you know, the isolation properties, you know, which is required for the power electronics is, is very important. And then uh, also, the radiation tolerance uh, because of the diamond rigid structure you know it, it withstand to the uh, very high you know energy particles uh, including charged particles uh, and and that is becoming an increasing area of interest mostly you know for space application defense application uh, so i mean these are the main you know important properties but of course apart from that you know, uh, the wind that I didn't mention is the electron and hole mobility is also, you know, very high as compared to the other wideband gap materials like silicon carbide and gallium nitride. Uh, some of the important things uh, that I just wanted to mention in terms of the scientific challenges, and, and that was also mentioned in the PRN report, uh, DOE's microelectronics report in 2018. Uh, and then, uh, you know, diamond, of course, you know, offers a combination of various interesting properties. Uh, but why I think diamond is still not, you know, able to become a, a mainstream candidate material for this uh, microelectronics is because of, you know, several bottlenecks. And, and um, you know, there have been progress uh, in the last decade or so. Uh, and then I'll, I'll touch up on those. But I think most important thing is the large area growth, single crystal diamond, uh, also the ability to have the n-type doping with the reduced defect density, uh, and and that is a continuous challenge. But you know there are have been progress. Also integration. So whenever you would like to uh, take the advantage advantages of this material, uh, you know you integrate diamond with other semiconductor materials, and that's what I'm I'm going to talk about. But there are several challenges, you know, for the heterotaxial growth because it's very difficult to grow diamond, you know, on the other substrate. Uh, of course, the interaction of the surface states, the, uh, you know, contacts to the diamond. And then, of course, when we talk about the integration, there is also uh, other aspects of the, you know, thermal management where, you know, when you try to integrate this material with other semiconductor material, uh, even though the thermal properties are, you know, excellent, but you have to think about the thermal boundary resistance, thermal expansion coefficient mismatch, and so on. Just to mention, uh, you know, there is recently, you might have seen that, uh, you know, Diamond Foundry, which is one of the company in the California, they work with, uh, you know, one of the German company. Uh, they came up with the, uh, you know, large area single crystal diamond wafer now uh, this is also available now in four inch area uh, of course the defect density is still high you know 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 7 but i think this is one of the important uh, you know development in the diamond area where we are now at least talking about single crystal diamond wafers um, 
Apart from that, I think you know there are various advantages working with the polycrystalline diamond, and and that's what gonna also I'm gonna talk about today. Uh, at Argon, we work on this uh, ultra nano crystalline diamond technology, which works on the principle with a different gas chemistry than the conventional hydrogen and methane gas chemistry. So we use argon and methane, which which mostly produce the C2 as the main growth radicals, um, which has a very low activation energy, uh, you know, to insert into the diamond lattice. Uh, and, and uh, you know, which gives rise to very high renucleation density, about 10 to the 11, you know, uh, nuclei uh, per centimeter square. And then uh, because of the very uh, uh, high renucleation rate and the low activation energy, you know, we can actually insert this C2 radicals uh, into the diamond lattice. Uh, yeah, and, and then we can have very extended temperature range, which is from uh, uh, going from the 400 to the you know, 800 degrees Celsius. Uh, so this is one of the important aspects of this growth process that we can produce, uh, you know, diamond, which is at about CMOS compatible temperature. Uh, by still maintaining the phase and purity, you know, of the diamond. So this is the uh, the 915 megahertz uh, large area system that we have here at Center for Nanoscale Material, which is a user facility. Um, and uh, using this process, then we can grow different flavors of the diamond, uh, uh, typically ranging from the different grain size from the microcrystalline diamond. Uh, you know, with a few microns to the ultra nano crystalline diamond, where the grain size is about just two to five nanometer, which is you know shown here in the TM. Uh, but since we can grow on up to eight inch area, I think you know uh, it has a direct uh, application with various uh, you know microelectronics processes, and the fact that now we can also grow at a CMOS compatible temperature range. Uh, you know, that's an added advantage as compared to the conventional CVD diamond technology. So we we had a four-year DARPA program sometime back where we actually integrated UNCD with CMOS, and this is for RF MEMS applications. I'm not going to talk about that, uh, you know, uh, here, but let me uh, go on to the, the first topic where I'll, I'll discuss the integration of nanocrystalline diamond with the gallium nitrate for the thermal management application. Uh, this was the work done some time back with uh, my collaborator, Alexander Balandin at the UC Riverside. Uh, so just to mention that, you know, uh, thermal management is very important aspects, of course, in the microelectronics and particularly when it comes to the power electronics. And, uh, you know, there has been a lot of efforts have been done with integration of gallium nitride on various different materials. Uh, but if you look at the benefits of diamond film as a heat zinc, uh, in this uh, graph, you will see that the integration of you know, diamond, physically bonding the diamond on the gallium nitride, uh, you, know, you can reduce uh, you know, the temperature of the device. So in this case, it shows that 80 degrees centigrade, 100 watts per centimeter GAN on diamond, you know, this can be packed nearly 100 times more densely you know, than the GAN on silicon carbide. Of course, uh, this this uh, work is done by the group four labs, uh, you know, sometime back now it's been acquired by, you know, the other company. Uh, but, you know, I think one of the important fact that I want to mention, uh, this is also a product now available, you know, from uh, various diamond companies. Uh, but this is one of the approach which has been used uh, for physically bonding diamond directly to gallium nitride uh, through some kind of a, you know buffer layer, uh, it could be silicon nitride or silicon oxide. Uh, but one of the problems you know that you see after repeated thermal cycling is the the bonding layer and the adhesion of the bonding layer, as you can see, uh, that comes off because of the difference in the thermal expansion coefficient mismatch. Uh, and also in this case, you have to grow a film about, you know, about 50 to 100 micron or even larger. So the cost, I think, also is an important factor here to grow, to grow that thick, you know, diamond film. So there are various approaches people have tried uh, to directly integrate diamond into the gallium nitride by using a CVD process. 
So in this case, uh, you know, they try to deposit directly by using hot filament CVD, uh, including the conventional CH4 and hydrogen chemistry. Uh, and then, you know, the problem here is, of course, even though the gallium nitrate can withstand, you know, higher temperature, but in case of a hydrogen atmosphere, you know, where you have more atomic hydrogen present that starts to, you know, attack the, uh, the basically gallium nitride. And then there is a reaction that, you know, happens with the gallium. And then, you know, you start to lose the nitrogen from the gallium lattice. And then, uh, you know, there is a decomposition of, of gallium nitride high, higher temperature. So they try to deposit at lower temperature, 650, but then, you know, you get a very poor quality diamond film with a very, you know, less adhesion. And, and that's why the, uh, the integration of diamond, you know, direct integration in the CVD process, you know, has these problems. So what is important is to be able to grow a high quality diamond at a lower temperature without damage to the gallium nitride lattice. So in this case, uh, we, you know, uh, utilized our low temperature diamond deposition technology uh, that was already developed for this, you know, DARPA project. And, and to see how we can, you know, deposit directly onto the gallium nitride wafers. So the approach here we use is, uh, you know, taking a gallium nitride single crystal uh, substrate and then depositing very thin layer of, you know, tungsten just for the adhesion. This could be, you know, uh, even a silicon nitride if you want to be insulating uh, and then depositing nano crystalline diamond directly on top of it. So you can see here gallium nitride uh, you know, substrate, and then after the nano crystalline diamond, uh, you know, there is a not adhesion failure. Uh, and then even for, you know, many months, we can see that, you know, it stays very well adherent diamond film on gallium nitride. Now, in this case, we actually did uh, two different approaches. So first thing is to deposit a uh, very thin 150 nanometer thick nano crystalline diamond on gallium nitride, and then uh, you know, uh, double that thickness to the 300 nanometer, and then then look at the thermal you know uh, dissipation when we attach directly to the uh, on top of the gallium nitride. So in this case, uh, you know, it's very important to check you know, whether the you know gallium nitride is is uh, you know not decomposed. So we we use the uh, Raman spectroscopy. Uh, before and after the nanocrystalline diamond deposition. And then you can clearly see that, you know, the gallium nitride peaks are pretty strong even after the nanocrystalline diamond deposition indicating, you know, it's, uh, you know, the gallium nitride lattice is preserved. Uh, and then we also did the next spectroscopy just to see the quality of the diamond uh, by using this pi star peak and the sigma star, you can clearly see that's a very high quality diamond with more SP3 bonded carbon. So we did not see any significant changes in the gallium nitride structure where the nanocrystalline diamond deposition was done about at 450 degrees Celsius. And, and these are the measurements that uh, Alex did in his lab. Uh, he has this uh, you know, uh, laser flash technique where he can look at the effective thermal conductivity of this nanocrystalline diamond film deposited uh, on the gallium nitride. Uh, so what you are seeing here is the effective thermal conductivity of the composite film. Uh, um, and then we, we use different thicknesses, 150 nanometer and 300 you know, nanometers. And then what is plotted here in the blue uh, you know, circles is the reference gallium nitride wafer. And then as you can see that as the temperature is increased, the thermal conductivity of the uh, gallium nitride is reducing. Uh, but interestingly, when you look at the 150 nanometer, uh, you know, the thermal conductivity is actually increasing with the temperature and that gap also increases as we increase the thickness of the diamond film. So what essentially it is showing that even just the, uh, you know, 150 or 300 nanometer film, you are effectively, you know, getting very good thermal dissipation, which is about you know, a six time higher than the gallium nitride. Uh, and then if even if you increase, you know, to a little higher, you know, you know, you can basically increase the thermal dissipation, uh, you know, much more effectively because 
what is important is that when the device is you know getting uh, you know heated because of the higher power dissipation uh, you need a very good thermal conductivity so using this process maybe you can think about depositing this nanocrystalline diamond near the junction you know where there is a more heat dissipation source and then effectively you can use it for uh, dissipating the heat you know properly so um, I will now talk about the uh, another uh, you know area that that we have been working on uh, some time back, and and first I'll talk about integration of you know two D materials like graphene on diamond, and then uh, you know towards the end I'll talk about very interesting approach where we can you know put N type MOS two on P type diamond, and then this is just the VDW Wonder Wall epitaxy or Wonder you know Wonder Wall um, you know stacking process. And then uh, you know it basically behave as a kind of a PN junction. So let me start with uh, integration of graphene on diamond. Uh, you know there has been a lot of work actually already been done with integrating, of course, you know graphene based devices on SiO2. Uh, but if you look at you know the graphene on SiO2, about seventy seven percent of the heat dissipates into the bulk silicon through this. SiO2 and then remainder of the heat, you know, is, is uh, you know, through these contacts. But if you look at the diamond, uh, you know, then you can get, of course, benefit of the very high thermal conductivity of the diamond. And then uh, why the interface is so important because the mobility, you know, decreases with the temperature rise. And then if you look at, you know, about the rise of Let's say 10 degrees centigrade in the operating temperature of this, you know, IC uh, 3D integrated circuit. You know, it will add about 5% of the delay. So uh, it's very important uh, to have very high, you know, thermal conductivity when you're building uh, devices on a substrate. So the question is, of course, you know, why diamond? Because of course, it's chemically inert, has a very low trap density of charges as compared to the SiO2. So that helps in reduction in noise and, and getting better signal to noise ratio. Also, diamond has a very high energy uh, for optical phonons uh, you know, as compared to SiO2. So that reduces the surface phonon, you know, electron phonon scattering to improve the saturation velocity. And, and of course, you know, diamond has a higher thermal conductivity then SiO2 and, and then copper. So, you know, it's a better heat dissipation to increase the current density. And, and, and you know, with the CVD diamond technology I already mentioned, which is well matured, you can, you know, you can have a diamond wafers, you know, uh, at a different wafer size and even including now single pistol diamond. So the question is how this graphene on diamond, you know, devices perform. Uh, so this is a single, you know, two terminal and three terminal devices that we, we fabricated, including the field effect transistors. And, and uh, you know, we, we got very good uh, mobility for the electron and holes with the, uh, you know, carrier density, and this is at room temperature. Uh, but uh, when we look at, uh, you know, like pushing the current through this graph in ribbon, uh, we, we see that, you know, we get very high, you know, current density. Uh, in case of a single crystal diamond, we're able to get the breakdown current density up to 10 to the 9 amps per centimeter square, uh, which is pretty high. It's almost like a superconducting wires, but at room temperature. And, and uh, so this, this exceeds the current capacity of a copper like 1,000 times. Um, now, the question here we were looking at is, of course, we did the, uh, you know, the, you uh, know, uh, uh, the exfoliation of the graphene and then you know stacking directly onto the diamond. We wanted to see if we can convert the diamond into the graphene. So there has some work you know done in the past with uh, utilizing uh, you know iron uh, for making uh, you know a, a graphene on diamond and silicon carbide. Uh, also annealing you know diamond at higher temperature uh, that also gives the the graphene growth. Uh, but in the first case, you know, you have this metal layer that needs to be removed after the growth. And the second case, uh, you know, the diamond that you, uh, the graphene that you grow is, is, you know, in a vertical direction, not in a planar. Uh, so we wanted to see how we can do this on a, a ultra nanocrystalline diamond, which is a polycrystalline diamond. So we came up with the process where 
we grow a very thin layer of a nickel, which acts as a catalyst onto the diamond surface and then do the uh, rapid thermal annealing uh, just for about a minute. And then what we saw that you convert the top layer of the diamond into either you know, few layer graphene or a single layer graphene based on the, you know, the conditions of the annealing that you put. Uh, so if you see the cross section here in the false color, you can see uh, you know, the graphene, uh, which you can see the few layer graphene and the beautiful Raman spectra. Uh, the unique features here is that you know, the, the diamond layer underneath acts as a carbon source. And then uh, you have fine control on growing either single or multi-layer graphene. Uh, most importantly, you know, we, there is no traces of nickel, so you don't have to etch the nickel from the top. And the operating temperature range is also, you know, pretty manageable between 800 to 1000 degrees Celsius. And just within a sec, uh, you know, few uh, seconds or within a minute, you can convert the whole four inch paper into the single or multi-layer graphene. So we, we have already, you know, several patents on this process, and this was published some time back. Um, but let me walk you through the, uh, you know, the characterization of the graphene. Um, you know, of course, you know, if you see there are some wrinkles on the graphene that might create, you know, some problems. Uh, but, uh, you know, there was no stresses of nickel, as you can see from the XPS also, no oxygen at all, so which basically shows very high quality graphene grown. Uh, when you compare the Raman spectra with, uh, you know, the single layer graphene on copper or the transfer, you see there is some shift, you know, in the 2D spectra. And, and that is very typical of when you grow any potassial uh, graphene on the silicon carbide, because there's a bonding between the graphene and the underlying substrate that produces some strain. And then there is a, uh, a little shift that you see, you know, in this 2D spectra. But we saw that you know there is very high quality graphene can be grown, and then the another way to check the quality, of course, is to make a device uh, through this patterning process, and then you know look at the uh, the carrier mobility, uh, and then we got a very reasonable you know uh, mobility for electrons as well as uh, you know carrier density uh, you know at room temperature. Uh, so this is very good you know, for RF transistor applications. Uh, and then you can uh, really pump very high current density you know, through this uh, you know, graphene layers here. Now, since uh, you know, we got excited about this process, we wanted to even further see how exactly the mechanism of this uh, you know, graphene growth happens. Uh, so uh, we did an interesting experiment. We actually made a hole with the FIB uh, before the RTA processing, rapid thermal annealing. And then, you know, after that we did. So as you can see, this is before and after annealing process. Uh, you know, the holes are basically covered now with the graphene. So within a minute, you know, it covers basically that hole. And then we get a nice, you know, uh, graphene uh, already grown over the hole. And, and then when you look at this graphene, this is a single domain graphene you know, with a very high quality, uh, you know, said, um, selected area diffraction that we can see. Um, you can actually characterize this by using the, uh, you know, D by G ratio as well as 2D by G ratio uh, and showing that overhang graphene, which is just a single layer graphene, you know, has a very high quality. Uh, now, it's a very interesting growth process that happens here uh, that you have a nickel, and then carbon source, and then you have a thermal gradient, uh, and that basically a driving force to grow this, uh, you know, uh, nickel laterally, and then form a junction here. Interestingly, we did not see the the grain boundary, uh, but you know, intrigued by this process, we worked with our uh, theory and modeling colleagues uh, to understand this growth process even further. Uh, and so, what we see is that as you put nickel on top. Uh, and as you increase the temperature, the grain boundaries, since you know the diamond has polycrystalline, it has a lot of grain boundaries. So these grain boundaries acts as a sink, you know, for nickel to diffuse, you know, very rapidly. But during this process, you know, there is a catalytic reaction happens, and then the, there is a conversion of diamond, you know, underneath to the amorphous carbon clusters. And then what we see here, there is a formation of nickel island. 
uh, that actually nucleates this amorphous carbon into this ring-like structure, uh, which is the initial nucleation phase of uh, you know the graphene growth, and then that's how you know the graphene grows. Uh, if you look at the detailed uh, molecular dynamic simulation that has been done uh, on a different phases, uh, you know planes of the nickel, it looks like that it favors the nickel one 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 in getting this you know. Uh, the uh, uh, carbon rings basically nucleated very fast. And when we looked at, you know, our, the nickel, which is deposited, uh, which has a 111 phase. And we think that during the annealing process, you know, this nickel 11 phase growth, you know, even faster. And that basically forms the nucleation for the, uh, for the graphene. So, you know, the, the probable, uh, the mechanism that we think is that during this, uh, you know, annealing process, there is a growth of this nickel 11 island. And then immediately because of the carbon beneath uh, this, you know, acts as a carbon source, uh, which converts into amorphous carbon and forms this, uh, you know, rings, graphene rings, which grow very rapidly, you know, laterally. And then, you know, this process, the nickel does its work and then goes through the grain boundary and sits at the, you know, UNCD and silicon interface. And that's why, we don't see any stresses of nickel, you know, on top. Uh, so whenever you make devices on top of this, you know, which are actually electrically isolated from the nickel, because then you have insulating UNCD here. Uh, so, so this naturally forms a very good way of converting the diamond into the nickel, uh, into the graphene, and then forming, you know, gives a, you know, ability to form very good, uh, you know, device structure on top of it. So with this uh, process, we, we can take a full advantage of intrinsic properties of the graphene. So like overhangs graphene or suspended graphene, because whenever graphene is in suspend form, you know, that's where you get a very, you know, nice properties of the graphene. Uh, so we can think about, you know, making a various, uh, you know, RFET structure with that. We can also think about uh, sensors you can pattern the nickel and then they, you know, form the graph in nano ribbon where you can open the band gap and things like that. So uh, this is one area that we worked on. And then I will quickly uh, touch upon one of the interesting results, you know, that we got some time back. So we, as I mentioned earlier, you know, one of the problem in, in diamond is, is getting an N-type doping uh, because of the problem with the n-type dopant, uh, you know, which are very high, uh, you know, produces strain when the, you know, like arsenic or phosphorus when you try to implant into the diamond. And, and that's where really the mobility goes down to the drain because of the defects produced. And, and there are a lot of other interesting approach people have been trying with the delta doping approach and things, which is very difficult. Uh, so we, we were thinking of how we, we can put this N-type MOS2 on top of the P-type diamond uh, and then see, uh, you know, whether we can see a kind of a pseudo uh, delta doping where the, uh, the N-type MOS2 acts as an N-type dopant. And, uh, you know, we see very nice PN junction and, uh, you know, diode characteristics here with a very high current density. Uh, and and uh, the question is now, you know, whether it is really forming a kind of a, you know, junction. So this is another, you know, we are already working with the theory people to think about, you know, this kind of stacking process and in, in, in this MOS is just one material. We can think about other 2D materials uh, stacking on top of diamond uh, and then, you know, doing the detailed characterization of the interface uh, you know, to understand this charge transfer doping process. Uh, and then, of course, we can also look at, you know, how the surface termination uh, might affect this charge transfer doping and, and whether it is possible to remove this limitation of diamond of N-type doping with this kind of virtual, you know, N-type uh, doping on the diamond process. So with that, I, I would like to, I think I'm coming towards the end of, you know, my time, I would like to summarize uh, by saying that, you know, with this low temperature process, we already shown that it's possible to integrate diamond with gallium nitride. Uh, and this approach could be used for, you know, GAN hemped, where you can deposit diamond near the junction to really, you know, get the, the benefit of the thermal, you know, heat dissipation through the devices. 
Uh, I think this integration of you know two D material in diamond is a you know new opportunity uh, where we can think about you know uh, maybe uh, overcoming some of the uh, the bottlenecks that we have in the diamond process and and see if we can have this heterojunction uh, to uh, really make it useful for you know various uh, you know electronic application including very high thermal conductivity. So with that. I would like to thank uh, all the collaborators and also, you know, the nanofabrication and devices group members uh, from my group uh, that contributed, you know, various way uh, for this and a lot of other work. Of course, the, uh, you know, the uh, the DOE grant, you know, from our NSRC and the, the lot of competition work that has been done by the theory and modeling group uh, through uh, Mira Supercomputer. Thank you very much and I'll be happy to answer any questions. So uh, in the interest of time, we will have time for a, a, a like a, a two, maybe two quick questions. So, and yeah, I'll try to say one of the two questions. Do you yeah. think the, uh, the quality of these nano diamonds or the, the quality of the diamonds actually matter? For example, if you're trying to uh, create an interface for, uh, for example, uh, of MOS2 versus other properties? Like how important is it, the crystalline of the uh, uh, diamond? Yeah, I think, you know, for this kind of approach, you know, I'm mostly thinking about the single crystal diamond. Uh, when I talk about the thermal management, that's where the polycrystalline diamond could also be, you know, very useful. But when you're talking about active interfaces, I think, uh, you know, that's with the single crystal diamond. Uh, would be very important, and and as I already mentioned, you know, people are growing, companies are growing this uh, high quality single crystal diamond, you know, in two inches, three inches. So that's not a, you know, distant dream. I think this is possible if we can get a, of course, very high quality single crystal diamond, uh, and and you know, we can think of this thing. Uh, you know, you don't have to have a right away. Uh, like a single crystal four inch vapor. Uh, you can have templates of this single crystal diamond that could be transferred onto the other virtual substrate and then you know form this junction because what's important is is to make this junction and interconnects and, and then uh, then you can you know have the benefits you know, of the diamond properties. Thank you. Uh, anyone else have a question? Uh, if not, we'll thank uh, Ani again. Uh, actually, I have other question, but we'll leave that to the end of the session, maybe. Um, so our next speaker is uh, uh, Jia Chi from University of Washington. Uh, he's now in uh, Professor Xiaodong Xu's group, and uh, he's interested in doing quantum materials, promising both for QoS and for uh, microelectronics through um, by utilizing their uh, normal properties. Uh, Jaji, please take it away. Oh. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, can you see my screen? Hello? Yeah. Cool. Okay. Uh, um, uh, 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 thanks for the introduction. Actually, it should be Xiaodong who uh, presented today, but Xiaodong has some uh, uh, I have some health issues, so I, I have to come here to 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 present uh, instead of him. So uh, let's get started. So uh, today I want to present about our recent very surprising uh, discovery of fractional quantum anomalous Hall effect in R stack twisted MOT2. And as you can see here, what I want to present today is actually a very interesting property of the electron that is trapped in two dimensional. Uh, so if you trap uh, electron in the two dimensional together with very strong electron-electron interaction, the electron is, is actually fractionalized into some uh, uh, quasi-particles called parton. So uh, uh, let, 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 uh, let's move uh, uh, towards the, the, the goal actually. So uh, 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 like uh, 30 years ago uh, or even more, uh, integer quantum uh, hole effect actually got uh, discovered by uh, 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 a cleansing group in. Uh, 
uh, and uh, it quickly got a Nobel Prize for the discovery of this uh, quantum Hall effect. And nowadays we know the quantized whole kind of uh, resistivity serve as the standard of uh, any resi uh, re resistance measurement. So if you hook up your multimeter or anything, if you take any resi uh, resistant uh, uh, measurement, uh, most probably you are referred to this uh, quantum Hall resistance. And most surprisingly is actually if you add interaction to the system, uh, basically uh, for, for a quantum Hall effect to form, you are occupying a so-called lambda level that for, uh, that for two dimensional electron gas formed in very high magnetic field. If you fractional field this uh, uh, system, uh, because the large degeneracy of the electron ground states of the uh, lambda level, uh, only interaction can modify the uh, property of the system. And another very, very surprising observation uh, later is actually people found uh, a fractional plateau of this uh, 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 quantized Hall effect. And it's quickly got, uh, got another Nobel Prize uh, for the discovery of this quantum fluid, so-called uh, fractional charge excitation in this uh, fractional quantum Hall, Hall effect. And it's now widely observed in many, many two-dimensional systems, uh, such as graphene, gallium oxalate, gallium aluminum oxalate, uh, uh, and also uh, even silicon uh, MOSFET, traditional uh, uh, fat. So uh, 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 like uh, uh, after people discover those uh, uh, interesting uh, quantum Hall effect in this two dimensional electron gas subject to very strong magnetic field, actually people discovered the main uh, 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 contribution of the effect is a so-called topological invariant of this uh, lambda level. So can we actually use uh, uh, electrons band structure to mimic the property, especially the topological property of the lambda level, and then we can reach, uh, we, we, we can even like uh, uh, reach the so-called uh, uh, quantized Hall effect in zero magnetic field. It become, uh, becomes the cent center like uh, motivation of uh, uh, so-called quantum material area. Uh, and uh, what, what people found is that in a band structure, not only the dispersion surface uh, a very important uh, uh, effect uh, to study the material property, the topological uh, 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 the topological property of the band structure also matter. For example, what I show here is that a to topological trivial band involves gradually uh, 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 re with respect to some parameter to a topological non-trivial band structure. And what we can see is that the edge states emerge inside the band gap. Okay. So what essentially happened is that the topological invariance or chain number is actually changed as you change the topological property of the, the, those band structure. And that leads to the uh, uh, 2016's uh, uh, Nobel Prize for their theoretical discovery of topological phase transition and topological phase of a matter. Uh, and actually, even for now, they are very, very fruitful uh, 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 progress uh, after a 30 years discovery of quantized Hall effect. For example, very recently, uh, people use uh, 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 people use fabricated nanostructure on gallium oxalate, gallium uh, aluminum oxalate structure to form the so-called quantum point contact and do interferometry and the noise measurement of the quasi particle. Um, people found the noise that is coming from the uh, uh, quasi particle is no longer uh, electron uh, uh, like a, a, a electron charge, but a fraction of the electron charge. Uh, that actually proves uh, the so-called fractionalization uh, property that one electron actually fractionalized to its uh, so-called pattern of the uh, electron. Another, another, uh, uh, another progress that is, has been made in this uh, uh, system is actually you can now do interferometry and time resolve measurement to see how these quasi-particle uh, interfere with each other, uh, which is actually a, a very novel quantum phenomena, and that's a very important uh, 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 like route to uh, towards like uh, quantum computation using those fancy uh, quasi particle. And also people can use uh, uh, optical spectroscopy to actually visualize how the current is flow. For example, here, uh, 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 Yugusa group actually demonstrated using the scanning micro photoluminescence to observe the photo emission of the uh, 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 quantum well uh, and the pump an electron from the contact. And you can see below from the uh, animation uh, you can use PL to actually track how the electron is flowing. It's actually not an electron, but it's actually a, 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 a one third charge of electron. So it's a pattern. Okay, so uh, what else we can do to uh, actually make the uh, functionalize even more? Uh, the idea is that 
all of this system has to be placed, uh, placed into a very strong magnetic field for those uh, 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 novel quantum phenomena to emerge. So actually what people found is that uh, even without the magnetic field, we can also uh, uh, reach those uh, uh, so-called quantized Hall effect. So we start from quantum Hall effect, which is actually those quantized uh, 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 Hall effect uh, at a strong magnetic field. Uh, if you if replace the magnetic field with the magnetization of a ferromagnet itself, actually the ferromagnet itself can also uh, 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 has this topological effect uh, uh, as, the, as, as I just introduced in the, uh, uh, in the topological band structure uh, stuff. And that is actually observed very soon uh, after the theoretical prediction, okay? And people use uh, 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 MB grown uh, chromium doped bismuth selenite, uh, bismuth tellurite, bismuth selenite. Uh, people observe the so called quantized anomalous Hall effect, uh, which is actually zero magnetic field version of the quantized Hall effect. So, what we can see is that if you put this uh, MB grown sample uh, in very, very low temperature, you can observe two uh, 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 phenomena. One is that you, uh, you, you see hysteresis loop when you sweep magnetic field up and down. That's the hallmark of uh, uh, ferromagnetism. And second thing is that your, whole, uh, your, your, long, your longitudinal resistance goes to zero uh, uh, at zero field. And your whole, uh, uh, whole resistivity quantized as a, uh, as a unit of H over E square. Okay, that's, that's leads to the discovery of so-called quantum anomalous Hall effect. However, uh, a fractional version of this quantum anomalous Hall effect or fractional quantum anomalous effect is never achieved uh, owing to, for example, the defect density of this uh, MB grown sample is too high. Uh, there are no interaction at all, uh, et cetera. So in today's talk, I will introduce you our recent discovery in this, uh, of this uh, fractional quantum anomalous effect in R stack or artificially twisted uh, a moly dipolarite, which is uh, which in its more layer form is uh, 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 to, uh, is in, in its normal uh, more layer form is a semiconductor. So the material problem is actually those the recent uh, progress uh, of the quantum material community is the Murray uh, uh, quantum matters, and then we will introduce our prop, which we use actually optical spectroscopy to establish the correlated states and the topological property of the system. So. Uh, for more, you can see uh, our uh, two recent paper that discuss the uh, uh, quantum uh, magnetism inside the system and also the uh, fractional quantum anomalous Hall effect. Okay, so first I want to introduce you is actually a, a, a very like recent hot topic, which is actually Murray quantum matter. So what is Murray uh, quantum matter? Is uh, uh, you take like two sheets of uh, 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 two-dimensional material and you rotate with respect to each other like a very marginal uh, twist angle and form together an interface. Now, what you can see is that uh, the original lattice form now a reconstructed very large scale lattice, okay? So originally, for example, for graphene is the uh, 2.5 Armstrong scale, but now it forms a nanometer scale, a Murray super lattice. And these super lattice give us a very interesting ph phenomena such as so we can use this twist angle and also gates to rationally uh, uh, engineer our band structure. What I've showed here is that if you have two sheets of graphene, which is a uh, uh, Dirac semi-metal, semi you can put them together. The tunneling effect be be between these two uh, twisted uh, 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 metal layer actually give rise to those flat bands. And the further theoretical study proves that those uh, in twisted double bilayer graphene as an example, uh, uh, electric field can tune the uh, topological property of this uh, uh, flat band, and you actually end up with a topological flat band. Okay, so to experiment actually follows up very quickly for the surprising discovery of superconductivity in this tw marginally twisted graphing uh, uh, bilayer. So what you can see is that if you uh, uh, hold up the system to so-called uh, integer filling uh, of the uh, Murray, which is you put uh, one hole per Murray super unit cell. So that can be reached by, for example, a single uh, back gate or top gate, okay? And then you will feel, uh, uh, you, don't be, you don't carry it into the system. It should be a conductor according to band, uh, ba uh, like band structure calculation, but actually an insulating state surprisingly uh, appear, uh, which, is, uh, which is due to the strong uh, electron, inter electron interaction in this Murray super lattice scale, okay? And you slightly dope the mode insulator. 
another quantum phenomenon actually uh, 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 arise, it becomes a superconductor. So that is actually uh, 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 corresponds to uh, what, what is called a doping the mode insulator picture of high TC superconductor. So considering this low carrier density in a metal and consider the uh, uh, co comparable very high, uh, uh, actually 300 millikelvin uh, superconductivity transition temperature. This is actually a very high uh, temperature like a, a, a superconductivity transition. Another piece of evidence is about uh, the topology of the system. Actually, at a, a new uh, at the electron doping site, people found this uh, emergent magnetism inside the system, and also the uh, corresponding quantum anomalous Hall effect in twisted bilayer graphic, uh, uh, additionally aligned to a, a, a hexagonal boron nitride substrate. Okay, so what do you you can see here is very is an is there are two uh, 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 effects. One is uh, you twist two non-magnetic material, and surprisingly low temperature. It spontaneously break time real symmetry and develop ferromagnetism as, the, as noted by those hysteresis loop. Uh, another effect is that the band population actually give rise to this uh, 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 Hall effect or a, a quantum anomalous Hall effect. Okay, so this is uh, two very nice and uh, observation of the system, but in real life, Marek is something like this. For example, if you naturally exfoliate the bilayer and do uh, uh, here is the uh, TM image you can actually see the moraes looks not very nice. If you add uh, and a uh, uh, further study, if you natural, if you artificially stack two, uh, 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 like a uh, two more layer together and form a device, uh, the, in, uh, the the moray actually has lots of disorder. So if you want to search no, uh, exotic quantum phases in this character structure, it's actually extremely hard. So then we need to come up with a very uh, 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 a smart way to probe those. Uh, uh, a Murray physics in a relatively nanoscale. So can we prove the Murray physics in nanoscale? Actually, uh, 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 the key is uh, how local or bar quantity can read out the topology of the system. That's the key problem. So if, uh, the, 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 as the definition of topology, the bar is actually insulating. So it's an insulator uh, that has almost no feature. So how you can extract information locally on the bar? The, uh, the key idea here is that really in this topological material, the edge current can generate a small but finite magnetization of the system. So if you take the uh, equivalent grand potential of the system and uh, uh, you, you can find actually the carrier density, uh, the change of carrier density uh, with respect to field uh, is proportional to the uh, change of magnetization and chemical potential. And the simply uh, apply a, a Maxwell equation, you can find the uh, uh, launched, uh, the, the whole uh, conductivity is actually proportional to changing of the particle number at, uh, with respect to magnetic field. So that actually uh, 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 put a very interesting connection between the topological number and the slope of dispersion of particle density, okay? And I put it in this formula where the lifetime size is the chain number or topological number that uh, uh, hallmarks the, the, the the topological property of the system and the dispersion of the carrier density with respect to magnetic field. And this kind of, so this is kind of abstract and theoretical. So what's, what is it should like in real life? So people actually take measurements, uh, compare, uh, especially the capacitance measurement on this uh, uh, graphene array super lattices and twisted bilayer graphene. So on the left-hand side is the capacitance measurement of a uh, 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 bilayer graphene, uh, hexagonal boron nitride, uh, moray super lattices, subjected to very strong magnetic field as high as 25 uh, Tesla. So what we can see is that there are lots of uh, uh, line-like structure that has linear slope with uh, uh, linear slope if you change the uh, uh, gate or the carrier density of the system, okay? As you change the carrier density of the system, you are mad those incompressed states, which you need to uh, put some energy to put one electron in. That's actually the definition of insulating states. So as long as you see a blue uh, 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 curve, it's actually an incompressible state. And the, con uh, the carrier density where the uh, incompressible state happens is actually linear shift with respect to magnetic field increasing magnetic field. So the slope of this shift is actually quantized according to the theory 
and experimentally you can actually uh, extract it out and it's actually quantized, okay? And uh, using this method, people can actually get a, a, a topological information of uh, uh, those system by extract the slope of the, uh, uh, those so-called strata formula uh, form. And on the right-hand side is uh, uh, in twisted bilayer graphene, people use a scanning probe to scan the, over the surface and find the best position uh, uh, with the uh, best position to observe, uh, to, to have lower disorder. Okay, so what people see is that at a very small magnetic field, you fractional uh, dope, the, you fractional feel the Murray super lattices, uh, it, it has like no dispersion at all. Basically it's topological trivial. But after apply five Tesla, uh, 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 a state showing here with a finite slope of the strata formula actually emerges. Okay, that's the hallmark of the fractional uh, uh, chain insulator or non-zero magnetic field uh, uh, version of uh, quantum uh, fractional quantum lambda effect. So to date, there's an, uh, no report of actual zero field fractional quantum lambda Hall effect. So now uh, uh, today I will uh, actually introduce you uh, uh, the, our, our recent uh, discovery of the fractional quantum lambda Hall effect in this R stack twisted MOT2. So if you stack two a transition metal can organize uh, a MO, uh, like a moly tolerate together and twist it with, with back to each other with a small twist angle. You can actually form this uh, large scale array uh, and note it as a BC site. So if you dope electron or hole into the system, the electron will sit on this B site or C site. And what you can see is that the stacking uh, 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 property of this B and C site is actually different. So for B site, the top layer is a metal and the bottom layer is a, 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 a cocogenite. So uh, the electron will localize on the upper layer. On the other hand, in C sites of the Moray super lattices, uh, electron or hole will localize on the bottom layer. Okay. If you look at the uh, periodicity of this Moray super lattices, it's actually full a honeycomb lattice with uh, uh, like a complex uh, nearest neighbor hopping and the next nearly, uh, uh, nearest hopping. And that is actually a, a, a very neat realization of uh, what uh, uh, Dan uh, proposed uh, 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 20 years ago, which is a, it's a, uh, it's a honeycomb lattice with complex hoping that has non-trivial uh, topological band. Okay. Uh, so actually uh, after people know uh, uh, the knowledge of uh, uh, twisted uh, 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 TMD, there are lots of uh, theoretical uh, prediction of, uh, for example, quantum alarm hall insulator, quantum spin hall insulator, fractional chain insulator, or Murray ferroelectric insulator, and the electric field uh, induced phase transition. I selected two of them to show the band structure of this uh, uh, twisted moly uh, dietolerate hydrostructure, a uh, homo bilayer. Uh, what you can see is that the top uh, two Murray mini band, that is the, the hole that sits on the Murray super, uh, 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 super lattice. Uh, has this uh, finite uh, uh, chain number uh, C equals to minus one. Okay, now you get the chain band and it's relatively flat and you have strong interaction inside the, uh, 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 on the flat band. Uh, what you can do is now calculate the many body phenomena of it. Basically you can construct a, a relatively small lattice size and see how those electron can interact with each other and form some uh, 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 quasi, uh, like a quasi particle. What I, can, what I show here is another theoretical prediction of this fractional uh, chain insulator or fractional quantum lambda Hall effect uh, as the ground state of the uh, fractional field uh, Murray band. Uh, you can see uh, there are three nearly degenerate states. And if you apply a flux, the three uh, states will actually involve with back to each other. And in theory, this, is, this remarks uh, uh, the, the, the emergence of uh, uh, a fractional pa particle because now your electron is not an electron anymore. It fractional into three parts and they can evolve uh, with respect to each other. Okay, so knowing the possibility to realize the fractional quantum anomaly effect uh, actually make, make, make us very exciting. And the next question is that what is the ideal prop to see those uh, uh, topological uh, property of the system? Actually in overlap, we develop lots of different uh, 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 prop. Uh, on the left, we show our, uh, one of our uh, results that using uh, optical spectroscopy uh, in detail is actually photo emission or photoluminescence of, uh, of the semiconductor. What we can see is that if you, if you fractional 
uh, if you fractional feel the uh, Moray super lattices and uh, observe the photo emission of the super lattices, we can see at a, a certain fractional feeling uh, of the Moray super lattice, you can see the TL is, uh, uh, is uh, 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 sharply got enhanced. That is because this is the interlayer exciton emission. Uh, uh, the interlayer exciton emission got enhanced if an insulator fe insulating feature uh, 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 developed. Okay, so it's actually, but the, uh, unfortunately in these Moray super lattices, the band is actually topological trivial. And all you can see, uh, all you can see here is actually fractional charged order. On the other hand, development with development in, in, in high mobility heterostructure, uh, semiconductor heterostructure also allow us to see uh, those uh, 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 fractional quantum, uh, uh, fractional quantum Hall effect in those semiconductor structures. What you can see here is that your longitudinal resistance subject to very high magnetic field, uh, 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 like uh, uh, you can see those uh, 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 integer quantum Hall or fractional quantum Hall effect. If you observe the trial emission, at those uh, uh, integer fueling uh, uh, or fractional fueling of the uh, uh, semiconductor lattices, uh, you can see the trion population actually decreased a lot because now we are not uh, seeing uh, exciton anymore, it's trion and the trion emission got surprised if there are no uh, particle that can bend it with the exciton. Okay. Uh, and, and then another essential prop that we develop uh, 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 during this year is this uh, uh, reflected magnetic circular dichroism. We can treat it as the AC uh, version of, me of measuring the uh, whole conductivity. So for example, we can measure this uh, RMCD on a more layer magnetic semiconductor, for example, a, a, a chromium tricolorate. And our previous results uh, give us an impression of how a magnetic material should look like. For example, this is the data token on a more layer magnetic semiconductor. And what you can see is that if you sweep magnetic field, the RMCD signal show a hysteresis loop. And the hysteresis loop remarks uh, 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 develop of long range order the ferromagnetism, okay? And another uh, quite interesting feature is that at zero magnetic field, there are a remnant RMCD actually re also remarks the possible development of ferromagnetism. Another interesting, a uh, phenomenon we observed uh, recently is actually you can use light to dope the uh, 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 Murray super lattices a little bit, and you can see this light induced the ferromagnetism uh, inside the system as, the, as you're changing the power of your laser excitation. Okay, so now we have idea prop, and we, uh, we, we know uh, our candidate is actually twisted uh, MOT2, but there are still some difficulty. So, observation of those novel. Uh, uh, magnetic state actually requires uh, 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 a an, an direct band gap or very strong emission, photo emission of the system. Uh, how, uh, so what we want is actually a well, uh, well isolated band edge at the uh, plus and the minus K value. So, so actually they are, uh, we, we are very good luck because uh, twist MOT2 is, uh, 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 is proved to be, a, to be a, a direct semiconductor. Uh, uh, what, what about the twisted version of this uh, uh, stacked bilayer? Is that uh, we actually perform this nano up pass measurement on the band structure of uh, the twisted uh, 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 more layer, uh, 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 I mean, twisted bilayer MOT2. And from our result, you can see that the twisted bilayer has a very similar band structure as the intrinsic bilayer. And the uh, gamma point is actually still like a few uh, tens of milli electron volts below the K point. So we are still confident that the twisted molydectal right, is still a direct uh, a semiconductor. So, okay. So now we establish our optical prop. We can have a checklist what's the requirements for a fractional quantum Lorentz Hall effect. It's actually fractional correlated states, magnetism and topological environment. And then we can do one to one a check uh, with our optical uh, 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 method. So for fractional correlated states, we can use photoluminescence to uh, see it, to see them. Uh, for magnetism, we can use uh, magnetic circular dichroism to see them. And for topological environment, we can use field dependence to adopt those so, uh, uh, previously introduced strata formula uh, to see the topology. Okay, so now we start to perform photo emission spectroscopy uh, over a sample. And when changing doping, and use the uh, spectrometer to collect all, uh, the, the energy resolved uh, uh, photoluminescence, we can actually see if we dope the system uh, at the fractional or integer feeling of the Murray super lattices, 
actually the trial population decrease. And that can be visualized very clearly uh, when you integrate those uh, PL uh, emission together and the collapse this figure into a single curve on the uh, right-hand side. So what you can see here is that uh, at uh, new equals to minus one or, quad or quarterly field system, uh, a deep on the PL uh, can be uh, 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 visually seen, okay? And for the fractional field case, you can also see a, a sharp decrease of this uh, uh, PL intensity. So now we actually establish that the correlated states are there, okay? So what's the mechanism to use the PL to sense it in this specific system? Actually, if you take the full spectrum, PL spectrum of the system, you can first see in the undoped region, the forming of exciton actually dominates, okay? As you start to dope the system, uh, your, firming, your firming surface uh, will, uh, will, will have a whole uh, uh, seats on it. And then it will bond it with the light induced exciton to form trion. So this is the trion emission over here. And as you dope into those correlated states, what happened is that the correlate, strong electron electron correlation actually gap the system out and there are no hole anymore on the forming surface. And only a very small population of thermally excited hole can be bonded with the exciton. So you see a sharp reduce of the trion population. Okay, so having checked the, uh, uh, the uh, correlated state, the next step is check magnetism. So we can perform magnetic circular dichroism onto our sample and changing the uh, carrier density as well as the electric field applied on the, uh, uh, which is a bio, interlayer bios between the uh, bilayer system. What we can see is that at zero, elect, uh, zero uh, electric field uh, as a function of uh, 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 a doping level, we can see the enhancement of the RMCD signal at the fractional filling as well as the uh, uh, nucleus minus one. And if you take a line cut and uh, take a, a magnetic field dependence, you can see clearly uh, the hysteresis loop of the integer filling as well as the continuums uh, magnetic states below the uh, nucleus minus one. Uh, what, what is notable is that the fractional field, the uh, coincy field, where, uh, which, uh, uh, which represents the energy you need to pay to flee the magnetic domain actually increase. Okay, and this is the hallmark of mag magnetism. So we have established correlated state and the magnetism in the single system. So now what we want to explore is actually what these correlated states and together with magnetism give, can give us to. So what we actually see here is that the correlated state can enhance the spin gap a little bit, okay? So if you zoom in on the RMCD uh, uh, scan, you can actually see that at the fractional states, the uh, 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 magnetism got enhanced. And by temperature dependence, you can clearly see that the, at, uh, at the two, two thirds, the magnetism is very strong. And the, we, can, we can now park our temperature at 3.5 Kelvin. And you can see clearly uh, that the, 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 the phase space of fractional uh, field, uh, uh, fractional states and the integer state are separated. And by performing line cut and the uh, magnetic field sweep, you can see that uh, in any other place, they are soft magnet, but at the fractional state and integer states, they are uh, a hard magnet. Okay, the next one is to establish topological property of this twisted bilayer uh, uh, moly that alert. So what we can see is we can perform the PL spectrum that uh, sends those uh, uh, correlated states as, as a function of magnetic field. So you can clearly see a strata like shift in these two states. And now we can do a systematic analyze of this phenomena by taking it in many, many different mag magnetic field, take this map in many, many different magnetic field and collapse in a single plot. What we can see that indeed in these fractional states is this, uh, 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 we see dispersion uh, uh, or strata dispersion. And this is actually quantized if you extract this uh, peak position. We also see in the fractional states, you have a fractionalized chain number and that the uh, uh, we also see actually another uh, fractional states. And we can repeat, we can very well repeat this measurement in any in, in other like a beam spot of the sample. So now we establish that there are non-trivial topology of the system, but we need to do a stand, uh, sanity check. What if this, this effect they actually comes from some trivial reason of shifting? So what we can do is that we can do the same experiment on the electron sites, okay? We can do on the electron sites, with effects to the magnetic field, and you can see there are no dispersion at all. So that gives us a, 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 that give us confidence to say, okay, this this actually this probe actually works pretty well. 
Okay, so next thing is to actually to check what's the interplay of the magnetism and non trip topology of the system. So, uh, uh, what we can actually do previously approved is actually the magnetism is controlled by electric field of the system. So, what you can see is uh, the hallmark of magnetism, uh, uh, MCD signal, actually drop quickly if you uh, uh, turn on the magnetic field, uh, electric field from zero to, uh, to negative. Okay, so you actually uh, uh, turn off the uh, uh, magnetism of the honeycomb lattice and the transform into a triangular lattice. So what it can do is actually it can also like uh, turn off the magnetism of fractional states. So what it will do to the uh, topological states. So what uh, uh, we can do the same uh, measurement again to see how the fractional state disperse with the electric field uh, with with respect to magnetic field. So there are no dispersion at all at this time. Uh, in, for nu equals to minus one, and they are not even a fractional field state. So this tells us the electric field can actually introduce a topological quantum phase transition from those co topological correlated states to topological uh, to tr uh, trivial correlated states in, uh, for nu equals to minus one, and it's basically kill these fractional uh, correlated states. Okay, so and then uh, uh, as a sad note, actually our result has very, very high reproducibility. And after we release the key information uh, during March meeting, a Connell group is able to uh, reproduce the result within two months. And that tells us the topological phenomena inside the system is actually a very, very robust uh, phenomena uh, 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 and it can be easily observed in, um, uh, uh, in different samples. Okay, so after, after established topology, magnetism, and also uh, 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 co correlated states inside the system. What's the significance of this observation? So uh, as I uh, previously introduced, the strong, strong interaction actually can friction, uh, fractionalize this uh, uh, quasi hall into the part of it. And uh, what we observed that two states, uh, uh, nu equals to uh, minus two thirds and nu equals three uh, fifths, they are actually those kind of fractionalized states that are supposed to host the fractional version of uh, uh, holes. Okay. So uh, what, what people can actually uh, proceed is those holes will form these patient's edge states and give rise to quantize the uh, fractional uh, uh, hole signal in transport measurement. And the, the next step, what we will do is to push even more to see a more novel fractional field uh, uh, states in this hydrostructure. And the people has already proposed a very uh, 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 like a promising uh, way to see, uh, to, to apply those non-abelian alien that host by those uh, uh, topolo uh, uh, fractional topological uh, quantum state in the system to achieve uh, uh, a topological quantum computation. And I think that's the uh, next step of our study. So as a summary, well, we reported the, the very first time the observation of uh, 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 a fractional quantum lumps in fact in R stack uh, twisted the molly that tolerate. And uh, this is the two paper we put on archive uh, very recently of the uh, of the quantum mechan uh, magnetism inside the system, and also as well as the the uh, the uh, fractional quantum lumps hall signal that we measure by uh, photoluminescence. Okay. Uh, 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 at last, I will I, I would thank uh, my PI and also uh, my uh, the, the very young team uh, on on this project. Uh, uh, for example, Eric Anderson who co lead the, uh, the 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 students together with me uh, under Xiaodong, and also Yino helped a lot in transport, wheel in optics, and other students for fabrication efforts. Uh, 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 thanks everyone. I'm open to question. So we'll have time for one or two quick questions. So R asked a really quick one. Um, so do you think any of these measurements can be like uh, observed at, uh, I know some of these, in fact, you have to watch them uh, uh, close to, to absolute zero Kelvin. Some of them you can survive to quite high temperatures. Uh, what decides say, which features yes. can be, yes, thanks. Thanks. Uh, this is uh, actually an excellent question. So in before, if you look at my introduction, those fractional quantum Hall effect happens in very, very low temperature. This is a, 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 three, a, a, a 340 millikelvin, right? And the fractional, uh, 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 fractional quantum Hall effect, you need to go even lower down to, for example, 20 millikelvin or, some, uh, millikelvin or something. But in our experiment, we actually push in this fractional quantum velocity effect, the band gap or the magnetism, the spin gap 
uh, decides the, uh, 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 the temperature. And what we observe is actually in two Kelvin, you can, or helium temperature, you can already observe those very normal, uh, very novel uh, quantum states. So that's a big step. So what decides the, uh, in which temperature regime you can see the phenomena is actually the band gap, the interaction strength, and also the spin gap, which is the, which is the, uh, you need to engineer the, uh, uh, the states in this uh, more of the lattice very carefully that you can uh, raise up the temperature. But we already have a big uh, a progress in raising the temperature from uh, dilution temperature uh, or milli Kelvin to Kelvin, uh, 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 like uh, it's already a two order of magnitude increase. Well, thanks. Thank you. With that, we'll thank Jiaqi again, and we'll go to the next speaker. The next speaker is Professor uh, uh, Cosme Lang from uh, uh, Texas uh, A&M University. And uh, uh, Cosme got his uh, uh, PhD and master's from electrical engineering from MIT. And uh, he come from uh, Tsinghua University, same where I came from, the uh, bachelor's, Bachelor of Science. His interests include nanomaterial and device for non-conventional uh, uh, computing architectures, uh, precise material design synthesis, AI for uh, 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 characterization, metrology, among others. So Cosme, please take the away. Thank you. Okay, yeah, thank you for the nice introduction. And uh, I'd like to also thank the organizers who organized such an uh, amazing uh, event. So today I'm going to talk about the uh, semi-metal technology for 2D semiconductor electronics. So uh, miniaturization has been a major technology driver in microelectronic industry. And uh, the scaling trend has been lasting for five decades. Uh, so by that, I mean each generation of computer, uh, the uh, density of transistor in the computer chip uh, scale up by a certain percentage or equivalently the size of, or the footprint of the transistor reduced by a certain percentage. Such a exponential scaling trend has been lasting for a very long time. It's not a straightforward task to accomplish. Behind this, each generation of electrical engineers and material scientists have put, uh, have put a great effort in inventing the uh, transistor architecture to keep the scaling going. So uh, the uh, structure of the transistor has evolved from this planar transistor to the 3D feedback structure, and more recently to the gate all around nano sheet transistor. And uh, uh, the uh, channel materials is made with silicon, and uh, the thickness of the silicon is around five to six nanometer. This basically limits the further scaling down of the transistor uh, technology. For example, for the TSMC uh, 5 nanometer or N5 technology, the uh, gate length of the transistor cannot be below 20 nanometer. Otherwise, the subthreshold swing would blow up exponentially, or uh, which means the transistor cannot be controlled effectively by the gate voltage, or the transistor can, ne can never uh, switch off. So the question we have is how to enable uh, a transistor with a thinner body thickness so that the uh, scaling trend of the transistor can keep going. Well, this is not an easy task to achieve. So for 3D semiconductors like a, a silicon germanium 35 semi, uh, semiconductors, uh, if we uh, shrink down the body thickness further, the because they are 3D semiconductors, the surface would be full of dangling bonds and the surface roughness. This would cause a severe scattering of the carriers in the semiconductor, which leads to the huge mobility degradation as we thin down the body thickness to below five nanometer. Then we introduce the low dimensional material like a 2D semiconductor, semiconducting transition that uh, metal that are collagenized. Monolayer of these materials is less than one, nano, one nanometer. 
And because of the low dimensionality, they have atomically smooth interface, and there is no dangling bounds on the surfaces. As a result, the mobility can stay uh, as high as we scale down uh, the body thickness to even below one nanometer. So this slide summarizes some of the opportunities and the challenges in this field. So uh, for opportun opportunities, as I discussed, uh, 2D materials are very good for further scaling down of transistors. And uh, uh, the low dimensionality also enables the special capability to engineer the material property at the limit of the atomic scale. And another technology benefit is uh, they can be easily uh, stacked on top of each other. So we can uh, achieve versatile 3D monolithic integration of different device technologies based on 2D materials. There are also challenges to make this, uh, this technology to reality. Here I listed some of the key challenges. Uh, the first one is about how to synthesize and transfer to the materials uh, with high quality and at a wafer scale. The second one is uh, how to deal with the contact resistance issue when we contact this 2D semiconductor with the metal electrodes. The third one is how, how we can uh, design an effective and stable chemical doping method to dope the contact and a sparser region of the transistor. And then we also need to develop a, a high-k dielectric technology to interface with the, to the semiconductors so the gate control can be perfectly as designed. Lastly, we also need to deal with uh, different non-ideal factors like the device uniformity, reliability, and the yield. So in today's presentation, I'm going to talk about how we can introduce semi-metal technology and our special approach to deal with these two challenges, the transfer and the contact resistance issue. To briefly summarize the key idea, we want to leverage the weak interfacial interactions between semi-metal and the 2D semiconductors this can give us uh, a couple of consequences. So that leads to different uh, uh, applications or uh, different usage of this heterostructure. So in the electronic domain, we demonstrated uh, uh, this uh, semi-metal bismuth or antimony can provide a barrier layers and a low resistance contact to these semiconductors. And we have demonstrated uh, uh, the record high device performance then in, the, uh, in terms of the chemistry, because of the weak interfacial interaction, we can use the semi-metals as a transfer medium to enable the wafer scale, trans uh, wafer scale and the defect-free transfer of the material, which can enable the 3D monolithic integration of technologies. So let's go to the first topic first. So uh, it has been very challenging for making good electrical contact to, to, to the semiconductors uh, for a few reasons. So if we look at the summary about contact resistance versus thickness of the material, we can see as, uh, as we thin down the material, the contact resistance become, becomes worse and worse. So the reason are uh, uh, for 2D transition metal decacogenize, Thinner materials gives a wider band gap. So for us, uh, the same metal, it would give us a bigger short barrier height that makes the transport weaker across the junction. The second reason is because they are all monolayer, like a three item thick materials. So they are more susceptible to any kinds of defects or interface impur impurities. The third reason is more fundamental which is called Fermi level pinning. And I'm going to introduce this concept next. So in the ideal case, when the metal and the semiconductor are in contact with each other, the only uh, thing that happens should be charge transfer. 
And uh, when they are in contact, the framing level should be the same across the entire junction. And uh, that leads, uh, uh, leads to a Schottky barrier at the, the interface. And in the ideal case, the Schottky barrier height would be just the difference between the, the work function of the metal and the electron affinity of the semiconductor. And if we plot this uh, trend, it looks like a linear curve with a slope of one. But in reality, besides the charge transfer, there are also rehybridization of electronic states at the interface. As a result, there are additional electronic states introduced within the band gap on the semiconductor side. Some, uh, we call it a metal-induced gap states. Some of the states comes originally come from the conduction band, some of them from the valence band. So in thermal equilibrium, the final Fermi level would uh, be located around the charge neutrality point of this uh, um, metal-induced gap states, which would lead to a large barrier height at the interface. So if we update this plot with realistic experimental results, for all different 3D, 2D semiconductors, the slope is uh, always much lower than one. That means the shock barrier height cannot be effectively modulated by simply changing the metal work function. So uh, previous work has demonstrated several possible approaches to reduce the contact barrier. For example, using electrostatics by heavily doping the semiconductor side, we can introduce more tunneling current and thus less resistance. The second approach is to find a more exotic material that can have a either very low uh, work function for n-type contact or very high work function for p-type contact. But as I mentioned, uh, the tuning is very weak, so this is not a very ideal approach. The third one is to decouple the interfacial uh, hybridization by inserting very thin dielectric tunneling layer. But at the same time, this tunneling layer also blocks the current. So there is also a trade-off. So now this approach is really solved the problem uh, very well. And uh, they are especially not uh, acceptable in the uh, 2D semiconductors. We came up with a, a new contacting uh, strategy. So if we replace the metal with a semi-metal around the charge neutrality point, the density of states uh, is uh, uh, close to zero or very low. As a result, the induced um, uh, the metal-induced gap states around this energy level would be also low. If this uh, 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 point uh, aligned with the band edge of the semiconductor, it's very likely we can mitigate the uh, uh, metal induced gap states and make uh, the Fermi level aligned at the edge of the uh, band edge, uh, at the band edge of the semiconductor. So luckily enough, we found that a, a, a bismuth is a semi metal that has a perfect band alignment with a uh, 2D semiconductor like a MY2. We did a, a DFT calculation to uh, showcase the uh, uh, contact mechanism. So after uh, MY2 is in contact with the bismuth, there are indeed metal induced gap states formed within the band gap, but uh, they are extremely low. And uh, the final Fermi level is located a little, uh, slightly above the conduction band edge. And here is another way to show the band alignment about the conduction band. So when MOS2 is in contact with bismuth, the uh, Fermi level is above the band edge and they are degenerately doped. We can verify this by conducting either XPS and Raman spectroscopy from the peak shift uh, for the X, uh, XPS MOLLE 3D peaks, as well as the A1G peak we can infer how much doping concentration or how much carrier density is introduced when bismuth is in contact with MOS2, and that they match with our theoretical prediction very well. And then now let's fabricate device to see if it indeed gave us a good contact resistance and a good device performance. 
so that we fabricated a different uh, contact uh, metal contacts uh, with our MOS tool and uh, make a transistor structure. As we can see, bismuth in this show order of magnitude better uh, current response with respect to the our baseline metal. And from the uh, spring current versus spring voltage, the linear response also indicates there isn't any energy barrier formed at the interface. To better understand the band alignment, we can conduct temperature dependent measurements. As, as we, we can immediately see, business contact has the opposite temperature dependence than the conventional nickel contact, for example. And uh, from this, we can replot it into the Arrhenius plot. And uh, from the negative slope, we can uh, extract the barrier height at the contact. So for nickel contact uh, uh, transistor, the barrier height is around 30 milli UA when the device is completely turned on. But for the uh, bismuth contact devices, the trend is opposite. That means there isn't any uh, energy barrier at the contacts, and this negative trend is dominated by the carrier transport within the channel of the M1 tool. Then we fabricated a series of devices with different cha channel length. And when we uh, measure the total resistance versus the channel length, we can use the y-intercept to extract the contact resistance. The value is uh, indeed very low. Using a similar approach, we can extract the contact resistance when bismuth is in contact with a, a variety of different 2D semiconductor like MOS2, WS2, WSD2. They are all well below one kilo uh, ohm micrometer. Uh, so I will show later these are the best reported value for all three materials so far. And uh, the Thompson sulfide Thompson selenide has slightly worse contact resistance. This is uh, reasonable because of the different band alignment. We then designed a fabrication approach to in, uh, demonstrate a short channel length transistor. And we, we reported uh, the uh, record high on state current behavior made all this, this uh, uh, short channel devices. Uh, so uh, we, we, we demonstrated a very good performance, but at the same time, there's an issue related to this much. So for the any back, back end of line fabrication process, we need the uh, when usually the temperature uh, needs a uh, very high, so we need to design a, a thermally stable uh, contact strategy. And also during the device fabrication, there are self heating effects. The true heating during the operation may also introduce a lot uh, higher temperature. If the thermal stability is bad, we could uh, also degrade the device. So in our experiment. We can see uh, after 300 degrees Celsius annealing, the interface becomes very bad. A lot of uh, voids are formed between the bismuth and the MOS2 interface. So later, our colleague at TSMC developed uh, uh, another semi-metal antimony in the same chemical group. This antimony has a much higher melting point. So we uh, measured a fabricated device based on it. And as we can see, antimony devices can survive different annealing temperature up to 400 degrees Celsius, whereas for bismuth contacts, the, uh, the, uh, the device performance is uh, completely gone after 300 degrees Celsius annealing. And uh, we further demonstrated that both bismuth and antimony can work for monolayer constant disulfide. Uh, and type transistors, and here are some typical device uh, uh, results. So bismuth antimony uh, performs equally well for Thomson sulfide devices, and these are also uh, the best performance device by the time we publish the paper. Finally, let's uh, compare different technology. So I showed you this paper, uh, this figure earlier. So color resistance versus thickness. Our work uh, uh, with bismuth contact indeed shows uh, almost one order magnitude better contact resistance than the previous work. And uh, we can also show contact resistance versus 2D carrier density. 
and uh, they are a, a family of uh, semi metal, including Bismuth, Antimony, Tin. They all show the best uh, performance among all different contact technologies. And uh, our, techno our technology target is around 100 ohm micrometer, so the Bismuth technology is very close for practical application. And uh, another uh, another uh, direction we are working on is to try to search for a good p-type contact solutions. So we did a computational screening, and uh, I uh, uh, tried to figure out the band alignment between the two uh, D semiconductors and a, a variety of uh, semi metal or uh, topological semi metal, as well as the different final walls materials. And for p-type contact, we want the uh, work function to be at least about five electron volts, especially if we want to work on, on this uh, tungsten diselenide. And we have identified a couple of good material candidates to form the good uh, p-type contact. And uh, so besides the high work function, there are additional requirements for forming p-type contact. We, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we also need to deal with the Fermi level pinning effect or the metal induced gap state. So uh, there are two approaches we proposed. One is a through, uh, to find a high work function semi metal so the low density state point is aligned better with the valence band. The other one is uh, we can use uh, Van der Waals metals because of the weak Van der Waals interaction, the metal induced gap state can uh, automatically be mitigated. Based on this, we found that uh, we, we computed the different materials, and uh, uh, when we plot the shock barrier height versus the work function, similar to the curve I just showed you at the very beginning, ideally we want the slope to be close to one. For a conventional metal, the slope is very low, 0 0.05, and for the two strategy we proposed, uh, the semi, uh, the high work function semi metal or the final walls metal contacts, the slope is around 0.5. That means the Fermi level pinion effect is indeed mitigated, and we have identified a couple of good materials for the p type contact. And with a, a multi scale simulation approach, we also estimated uh, what are the contact resistance and uh, this. The material candidates shows uh, contact resistance of below 100 uh, ohm micrometer, and they can also they can even go down to 20 ohm micrometer. And there's also some benefit about the scaling so as categorized by the transfer length. So uh, the next topic is so we use a similar effect, but in the chemistry domain, we designed the uh, a bad, a more scalable integration approach, so we can transfer a wafer scale of 2D materials onto our target substrate uh, in large scale. So uh, 2D material is a very ideal for 3D integration because we can synthesize them at higher temperature with a good material quality. Because of the weak fundamental interaction, they can be easily peeled off from the growth substrate, and then we can transfer them on top of each other to realize the 3D integration, just like how we uh, stack a Lego blocks. So uh, our vision is to integrate a, this a 3D monolithically integrated computing and sensing systems, integrate different functionalities, and uh, this uh, is not a, a possible without the easy 3D transfer approach. But in laboratory right now, the transfer is mainly based on a polymer-assisted transfer. So we spin code a polymer onto the substrate as a supporting layer. And with some chemistry, we can peel off the 2D material polymer stack from the substrate, and then we can transfer onto the targeted devices. So uh, this process is a manual and less controllable. We can only comfortably transfer one centimeter scale samples. And if we look at the characterization, there are a lot of polymer residues and the wrinkles on the substrate. We develop a more scalable approach. 
So we insert a metallic layer in between the polymer and the 2D material. The, the metallic layer is a uh, more mechanically uh, strong and uh, they can also offer better interaction, uh, better adhesion with the 2D materials. And then we develop this approach and combine with a commercial wafer bonder for silicon technology so we can easily transfer wafer scale to the materials with a good uniformity and free of wrinkles, tears, or defect onto the targeted substrate. And uh, we have tried different material, uh, uh, metal materials, the interfacial layer, and we found that the bismuth gave us a fast uh, transfer uh, results. That is also because of the weak interaction between bismuth and 2D semiconductors. So this is the DFT calculation for different uh, metal and the 2D semiconductors. And the interfacial adhesion energy characterizes how strong the interface interaction is. And the bismuth is uh, very close to all the other underworld interaction materials. And uh, this basically uh, gives rise to a uh, 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 the sweet spot for the transfer. So the adhesion is strong enough to hold all the 2D materials, but are weak enough to introduce any damage. And with that, we demonstrated the wafer scale transfer approach. Here are some uh, material categorization from the photoluminescence before after transfer. And the, the mapping, we can see uh, the material was intact after transfer. And with the STM measurement, we can count the, uh, uh, the uh, defect density of before and after transfer. So they show similar level of defect density, which means the uh, transfer approach does not introduce any actual defect. And we also have device measurements to show the device uh, performance are consistent across the wafer. And there isn't any hysteresis that also indicates the interface and defect are very good. To, to summarize, so we uh, integrated uh, this emerging semi-metal material family with 2D semiconductor, and we leverage the special interfacial interaction between these two materials. And on the electronics domain, we discover that this, this uh, contact strategy can form a barrier, barrierless metal semiconductor contact which is very useful in transistor technology, and we have demonstrated the best performance devices. In the chemistry domain, we use this uh, weak interaction of bismuth as the interfacial layer to facilitate the transfer and the 3D integration of 2D materials with the other technology, and that we have successfully demonstrated a wafer scale transfer uh, free of uh, wrinkles, uh, tears or defects. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge our colleagues and the collaborators at TSMC, MIT, National Taiwan University, Rice University, University of Florida, and Texas A&M University. Thank you. Thank you, Cosme, for the nice talk. Um, any comments from the audience? I have to say that I, I'm using my phone because uh, there's a problem with my computer, so I couldn't see who's raising hand. Please just unmute and ask directly. Yeah. So, uh, please. Uh, what? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, Cosby, I, I have a quick question for because, uh, uh, yeah, I know you just joined uh, uh, Tamu for a uh, professor, but uh, you work at uh, uh, TSMC for for like uh, this R&D, you know, project for the 2D material for so from, uh, 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 you know, uh, the industry perspective for the 2D material. So right now, the the what's the major you know challenge or limitation? For this, the scale, you know, scalability. I mean, you know, for the two D material, you, you're, you're thinking, is it still the size of the wafer or still the defect density control for all the? So from the material synthesis perspective, as a kind of both. So we, we need to 
in order to finally make it into real production. So right now, silicon is at a 12-inch scale processing. Yeah. Yeah. So we need to develop a synthesis approach that can offer high-quality growth for 12-inch 3D materials. And at the same time, we also need to make it a perfect, ideally a single crystal material with the last sense, the defect density as possible. And uh, there has been very good progress in the past two, three years. You can see on publication, people are indeed demonstrating larger wafer scale synthesis approaches to the materials. There are also different approaches to even induce a single crystal to the material growth. You can engineer the, uh, the substrate. And uh, uh, in terms of uh, AMOS DVD versus CVD, AMOS DVD is uh, easier to scale up. So industry is more interested in developing an AMOS DVD approach. Oh, the AMOS DVD, you mean to, to achieve the, the single crystal? Single crystal. To the achieve uh, single, single crystal and uh, wafer scale growth. Wafer scale growth. Conventional CVD, the precursors are based, based on solid, solid precursors. So it's not a, if you want to have a design a chamber, wafer scale, 12 inch wafer scale chamber with solid precursor, you can imagine how difficult it is to control the local uh, precursor density and the reaction rate. But for AMOS CVD, they are gas phase, so it's much easier controlled. Uh, so uh, another question for me is because you show for the silicon technology right now, I mean, you know, for TSMC already probably pushing forward for the so-called GAA, get a gate all around, uh, you know, uh, a technology or beyond this a thing fat already, right, for the whatever they call it, you know, 2N or, you know, 2 nanometer or 3 nanometer or even, you know, yeah. 1 nanometer technology. So. I, I, I'm wondering for this uh, monolayer, like the two, you know, TMDC type of 2D material, it does it get around the uh, ideas, concepts to apply, or I have to totally think about the other way to do that? Yeah, so for 2D material, with, uh, our thought about this is still to go along, go along this uh, get all, get all around structure. So we want to stack multiple layer of the semiconductor channel on top of each other to improve the current density. And uh, there are some benefits of replacing 2D material, uh, replacing silicon with 2D material, because they are very thin. One, one reason, as I mentioned, uh, the mobility can be reserved if we push the material to even below one nanometer. Uh, right now, the silicon body is usually three to six nanometer thick. Yeah, yeah. that's one benefit. The other thing is why we want to make the material thin. Uh, so in the get all around structure, you know there are three D architecture and there are a lot of parasitic capacitance. So one practical reason why we need to make the channel material thinner is if we make it thinner, if you look at the side wall of the the channel between the channel between the channel and the also the 3D source strain contact, there are parasitic capacitance. And mm -hmm. a thinner channel can, induce, can, can de decrease that uh, capacitance of, by a huge percentage. That's a huge performance boost. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, great, thank you. So well, let's see any, any other questions. So, oh. I don't know. You, uh, oh, you, oh yeah. in the absence of no, uh, Hua, you can take it from here. Yeah. 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 Go, go ahead. So you you want to say something? 
No, no, I'm not. I'm not. I'm just finishing oh. up here. Oh, 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 okay. So, uh, is there any question from the audience? So. Yeah, if uh, we don't have a uh, more question, let's uh, thank uh, Cosby again for this uh, nice, uh, you know, talk about uh, this uh, semi-metal technology improvement for two D material. Yeah, thanks, Cosby. Thank you. And thank you. Uh, yeah, so uh, well, it's already you know little past the twelve o'clock. So, and uh, if uh, we don't have any more any more question, you know, so we probably want to you know conclude our workshop for you know for today. And also, I believe I, I'm assuming this is also the last workshop for the user meeting. And the thanks everyone the you know pr the presentation and presents to support our workshop. So uh, we hope uh, you know uh, we can you know. Uh, continue our, this kind of like a discussion and also topic maybe for the future a user meeting next year. I hope uh, next year after APS upgrade finish, you know, we uh, have a chance to have a more on-site or physical, you know, uh, on-site meeting for the user meeting, you know, in, in, in next year or, you know, and going on. And then we can have continue our, you know, uh, topic for, uh, for microelectronics because uh, uh, APS and also Nano Center have a lot, you know, a lot of a, a greater, you know, a technology capability. So we can really carry out many from fundamental level to apply level research and R and D for microelectronics and devices and also materials. So yeah, thanks everyone. And then we can maybe just stop here. We uh, finish our recording and also the workshop. Thank you. Thanks.